Okay, I guess we'll head down the agenda pike then. Everybody's here except for Jane, and I suspect she'll show up before too long. Uh, first thing to do tonight on uh, Monday, October 7th, is um, call a meeting to order and approve the agenda. Um, at this point, is there any changes or deletions that anybody would like to put in? Seeing, seeing none. Um, actually, I would like to speak just a few minutes uh, about something that came, came to uh, me the other night on uh, news about uh, salt, and, salt and roads. Um, we'll just plug that in here at the end of the agenda there, just a brief discussion about it. Um, with that said, would somebody love to approve the agenda, please? I move to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Second. Okay. All those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Consent agenda items only consist of the minutes of September 16th, so that would take a quick approval. Somebody wants to make that motion. Make a motion to approve the minutes of the September. Second. Okay. And all those who wish to say aye for that as well. Aye. 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 Public. Uh, is there anybody here from the public who wishes to speak at this time pertaining to anything outside of the agenda? If not, we can move forward and uh, start in on the real first agenda item, which is discussing the Guptill Road speed signs. Okay, uh, yeah, if you're interested in coming up to the mic and uh, you can kick the conversation off and just state your name and let us know what you're thinking. Hi, I'm Macy Will and I'm a freshman at Harwood Union High School. I live on Guptill Road. Um, I'm here with my mom, my stepdad, Heath Dolly, and my brother, who's currently 12, and I'm 14. Um, we're really concerned about the speed issues on Guptill Road. There's been multiple times where my brother and his friends pull out of our driveway, which is at the bottom of the hill on Guptill Road, right in this big dip, and a car has almost hit them. It's really, really scary, and I really don't want to get hit. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm dad. <laughs> like this? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a flight of dramatics. Um, so I've met you all before we were here, I think, about a year ago. Um, and I think neighbors have been here more than once, so this are more than twice now, I believe. So we're here because um, the last time I was here, I made requests. We made requests that there was some, a speeding sign or at least a flashing light before something happened. And I thought I walked away that with a resolution that a flashing light was going to be put up or some sort of thing was going to happen. I walked away believing that you guys heard our concerns before something tragic happened, right? And then our dog got hit. And our dog got hit because somebody was speeding. He was going approximately 35 to 45. Heath did a whole, like, a whole scene. And he stopped, thank goodness. And but it was, it could have been much more tragic. King lived, and we're very excited about King's living through it. Uh, he's a bulldog, he took the car full on. But this was exactly why we came to you over a year ago, is that people fly on that road, they gain speed. And I heard you're like, the state police are gonna be up there, it's gonna be fine, construction's gonna start, and that's great. Except that none of that really has solved the issue that the state police have been great. I, I, you know, they've been up there, they've been patrolling. They don't patrol at five in the morning. 
They don't patrol on Sunday, which is when our dog got hit. Car was going so fast that the woman who was walking on the road, who King was going to greet, she thought she was going to be hit. Uh, and there's a theory that my daughter had come up with that King actually saved her life by running into the road. And for a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old to have to make up a story about why our dog got hit, instead of the town coming up and having to explain to your kids that the town promised or said one thing and didn't do anything is a harsh reality of politics. I think they're learning that anyway through school, but it's different when you live here in Vermont and you think that you all are listening and paying attention and actually care. I walked away with a general feeling of like, yes, okay. Heard our complaint and the flashing sign is gonna come. Right. I heard the reasons why there was no bumps allowed, speed bumps allowed. I heard the constructions coming. I heard the state police and I trusted you all that you had the best interest of us in mind. And I don't believe that you do now. I, you let me down and you let my family down. Because it could have been my kid. Uh, and I'm concerned that you really because I know I'm not the first one. I've s spoken with the mentors. They've been here several times. The Fishmans, several times. Right? It's, I'm urging you to do something before the dog turns into a kid. Because the kids love the park. I don't know if you know. Maybe you're, maybe you're so old that you've lost sight of what kids do. But they play. They run across the street to the Andruses. They tap the trees. They pour the maple syrup. They run up to the skate park. This is the best living that you can have. And safety is the number one thing for children. There are so many things in Vermont that we don't have to worry about. And this is one thing that we do, right? And with the light, I think there was like, oh, well, with the light, it will get better, right? No, it's actually rerouted people off of 100 coming through. I'm just, I'm really at this point begging you before something tragic happens. Because I thought you heard me before, and you clearly didn't. And in the conversation through posting something on a Front Porch Forum, several people reached out to me from Maple Street of they have the same issue. Their do dogs have been killed. You know, and I know that dogs, like, they run in the road. These things happen, and it's tragic. But when you have someone driving 35 to 40 miles an hour in a 25, where kids are playing and there's no sign for kids playing, there's no flashing light, they have no reason to slow down. So I, I'm just really here again to urge you to do something instead of saying that you will or instead of pretending that you care, just tell us we're not gonna do anything because we don't care. But then at least my children will know the truth and I will know the truth instead of having faith that you are gonna do something. I think before we get too far down this road, I'd like Bill to tell us, because basically as I understood it on the select board, we agreed to install the sign. We set a budget for it at that meeting. Then there was a discussion that there was, there was additional signage and other, um, in addition to that request, there was a project of signage and other things going on on Guptill. We were told that there was gonna be that was gonna now be included in that project. I know I've asked Bill um, at least once about this sign, and I apologize for not putting more pressure on understanding when it was gonna be, what the timeline it is. At some point, we have to say, that timeline's not working, we're gonna put this in. And $5,000 or whatever it was that we, we approved. But <clears throat> I think that's part of the unfortunate circumstance here is that it got approved at that meeting. There was another project that there was an opportunity, and, and I'm not saying this was the right decision, but there was an opportunity for it to be included in that and basically covered to a certain extent, whether it's the full price or a certain portion of it. I don't think there was enough from, from a select board standpoint of an understanding on timing. I didn't think it would be this long, personally, but I apologize for not being more on that and understanding that timing. So I'm sorry. Um, but Bill, I guess if you could tell us more there. 
So um, I understand your frustration. <coughs> Excuse me. I understand your frustration, and I feel badly if you really feel that nobody listened to you. Uh, I believe we listened and we all heard. And Mark is right. There's a. Uh, I won't get the name right, but I believe it's something to the effect of high-risk rural road projects that the state of Vermont through the Agency of Transportation is undertaking. And we asked them to come in. We put a, a speed or a traffic counting tube out shortly after the meeting that we had up in the center. Uh, the Regional Planning Commission gathered that information. They analyzed it. There had been talk about a three-way stop sign at the intersection there. The recommendation from the B-Trans people were there's not a warrant for a three-way stop sign. They did agree to put the feedback uh, speed limit sign in, <coughs> and uh, that project was scheduled, as far as I knew, to be done this year. Um, I've asked Bill Woodruff a couple of different times about it. After I saw your post on Front Porch Forum, uh, which I responded to, by the way, um, uh, and I put this information in there. I asked Bill about it, and he said, well, the trans uh, has it programmed and scheduled, but they've got other projects, and it's, it's probably not going to happen until 2020. So that's the latest information that I have on that. Um, and I know it's no solace to you, but there are lots of projects in lots of places, and, and these things take money and they take time to get done. Um, I did get a phone call today from another person on who lives in that area. Um, he's not able to be here tonight. He did affirm most of what Ms. Cryer just uh, talked about, that speeding is a, is a problem there. Um, I don't know how often, if at all, you folks have called the state police to report speeding. I encourage, I encourage you to do that. Um, we have the state police in town. There's uh, uh, 80 hours worth of coverage every week, Monday through um, Saturday. And um, they don't cover all shifts, they don't cover all days, and they can't be in all places at once. So this pro project is still in play. One of the things the person who spoke with me on the phone today suggested was that you know we should paint stop bars at stop lot. I mean at stop signs. I think that's a good suggestion. Um, we'll try to get that accomplished as soon as we can. And I don't I don't mean to make light at all of your concerns. Um, the flashing feedback sign. Um, I expect will will dampen some of the acceleration through there, but um, people get accustomed to whatever signage is out there, and then they do what feels right to them. And you know there are speed limit signs there already; they see them and they go by them. Uh, there are ordinances about keeping dogs leashed, and people let them run, and then they get hit. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we're not going to do this project. If the board wants me to spend money that we don't have in the budget, because this is a project that is scheduled to go ahead with signage through the state, um, you know, I'll try to get it up. I can't make any promises how quickly we can get that sign up. If we do it ourselves, we'll pay for it ourselves. It won't be part of that project. Was this so, about a five thousand dollar sign, or that's what Mike I, just I threw out? Uh, I is don't know. Is there any way? Is this is this program that would give us the sign from the state from VTrans or the state? Uh, is that something that they would pay a hundred percent? Would they do a reimbursement if we were to pay for it now? I don't know. Well, we could look into that. I suppose we could. Well, I gotta say, uh, I, suppose. I don't know that we didn't hear you, okay? Uh, when I first got on the board back a few years ago, somebody said I wouldn't last you very long because things don't move at the pace that I like to see them move at. And they were right. Things that are involved in government 
take forever. If I could, I could tell you, you know, I live right there on Guptill Road as well, across from Steve and Noah. And I have two grandchildren, and we make sure they stay away from the road. More times than not, driving up in that area, whether it be Neilan Flats, Guptill Road, any number of those roads, and I travel them all the time, because that's where most of my work is in that area. More times than not, I wanted to take law into my own hands when it comes to people going like hell. Uh, one of the reasons that I was trying to possibly, or one of the considerations there when I was talking earlier on a previous meeting about our salt and sand use in, in the town and maybe reducing it and had asked about whether or not if we change the conditions of how we treated our roads, is there a possibility that we could reduce the speed limit sign to help with people driving too fast on possibly less treated roads? The problem is the town doesn't have the right to make the, chain, the speed limit changes. That's a state issue that we, see, that we can't seem to get past. Well, At least that's what I've been told. It's not a state issue. The, the town has the authority to set speed limits on town highways between 25 and 50. You can't go lower than 25, you can't go higher than 50. And in order to set a speed limit, you have to do uh, a study. A tra and it, it's called an engineering, uh, traffic and engineering study. It really has no engineering involved in it. But, um, you know, you tell people, when, when I call the, the district administrator from the Agency of Transportation, he said, well, what you do is you start driving down the road at 25, and, you know, you drive this way at 25, and you come back at 30, and you go that way at 35, and you post a speed limit that you think feels the safest. And if you do a speed study, and you actually put out those traffic counters that we have. You're supposed to set the speed at the at the 85th percentile of what traffic is going. And by and large, people drive what they feel safe at. The 85th percentile on Guptill Road, I don't have it in front of me here now, but it's way higher than what's posted there now. Uh, if it's posted at 40 miles an hour, the, the, the speed uh, it's not in that section that's as bad, but as you go further north on the road uh, and the speed limit is lower, people are driving faster than that. So it's difficult to set a speed limit. You know, you can't set it below 25. And you've got to set it within what uh, seems a reasonable speed for the conditions of the road. And it's, it's very debatable for people who live on the road. They feel, well, it should be 25 or 30. You, you have an independent person do the study, and they're going to say, well, it really f should be 40 miles an hour. That's what it should be. <clears throat> you can't change the speed limit based on winter conditions or anything else. I mean, the road is posted for whatever it's posted at, and if you're going faster than that, you have an accident, the, the police can still give you a ticket for driving, you know, uh, at a speed that's unsafe for the conditions. So, you can't really set your speed limit for the worst conditions on the road. Well, this uh, scenario of driving the speed limit that you feel safe, does that take into consideration that there's kids around that might dart out into the road? Yeah, it, it, it really does. I mean, I, I've done it before. I've brought the information in. You can see it. You know, what my, my fear is, is, you know, it happened, there's a, one of these feedback signs on Stowe Street. And people see it, oh, I'm going 32, the speed limit's 25. They slow down and then they get past the sign and then they just go again. Yeah. So I'm not saying that these signs don't do any good. Uh, they probably do a little bit of good, but I don't think that you should expect to see a whole big difference in terms of people's behavior. People are people. They drive what they feel they should drive, and they calculate into that their, their uh, determination of what the risk is that they're going to get a ticket. And, uh, you know, that front porch forum exchange that went back and forth, 
will say I sent a message and he talked about, you know, there, there are kids there. If you're going to your kid's soccer match um, and you're late, you know, please don't drive so fast. One woman wrote in and said, well, okay, I won't, I won't drive faster than the speed limit, but if you're in front of me and you're going 10 miles an hour slower than the speed limit, please pull over and let me go by. And, you know, that's, that's <laughs> asinine. That, that's like, okay, you can't see what the person in front of you sees. Maybe there's a dog, maybe there's a kid. And really, you know, and I put in there, I said, yeah, gee whiz, if you could go 40 down the road, you'd get that extra thousand feet in, you know, the same, same time that you've been driving. So we can put up yeah. everything that you want, but unless we put up a camera that takes pictures of your car going by and sends you a ticket, which I don't know is a, if that's legal in Vermont, I, I don't see that you're going to do a whole lot. I don't want people to have expectations here. Maybe we dropped the ball. Maybe we're slower than we would like to be. And I know we're slower than we'd like to be because this was supposed to be done this year. And now the state's saying, well, we don't have the time or the money to get it done this year. We'll do it next year. But it was actually but, last year that we were here. So it's a well, year. Well, last year. That was 2018 when we were here. It's 2019 I going understand. into 2020. And we took the information and we gave it to the Agency of Transportation and they programmed it for 2019. And they haven't done it yet. So, so, you know, it, sorry, so, so, so if, if you want to, if you want to speak, please just come up. You have to come up to the what mic. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that that I don't want people to have false expectations that just because a sign goes up, that means people are going to drive more slowly than they are now. That's all. Bill, thanks. Um, I, uh, I have been before the select board before for this issue, and at that time the speed limit wasn't 25, I think it was 35 up around the hill and on to toward the center there. Um, and uh, we were told that there's a few steps that have to be taken first and then we can make this change. And it was the drive study. Um, put the strips down to see what the speed is. You can only change it X amount within what people are driving, et cetera. Um, and those things were done, and a new speed limit sign was posted, and that change was made. And I can't remember exactly how long it took. It didn't take that long, but it took a little while. Um, and I really appreciate Mark recalling the end of the meeting the way we had, because I felt bad that I hadn't looked up in the minutes. But I think we all left with a clear understanding that a motion had been put forward, that this is what you were going to do. And so when I spoke to my neighbors, I repeated that story that, yep, they're going to do it. They said they're going to do it, and the sign is going to come. And then it took a while, and I said, well, you know, we just had a regular sign. This is going to be a flashing sign, so it might take a little longer. Um, and so I feel, I don't know, um, rug pulled out from under you, or what do you want to say, that it's been this long. Um, and it is unacceptable. And I do want to speak to uh, the point about, well, people drive the way they drive, and uh, it is true. There is fatigue with the sign, and that's why, you know, we made the change to a 25 mile an hour sign. Stady sat in a couple of the driveways, and people got ticketed, and it kicked in that it's 25 here. And the people's driving behavior did, I think, improve dramatically um, in those years. Um, now we're in a situation where people are looking at the amount of young people living right in that little hill spot and walking up to Hope Davy and, you know, we need to do something more. Obviously, long term, we hope that we're talking about sidewalks, we're talking about real bike and pedestrian access, uh, safe access on Guptill Road. In the short term, we're talking about impactful signage that will impact people's behavior. Will it do it for 20 years? Perhaps not. If it does it for two years, we might save a life. Yeah, I, I, I agree and with And I you think know. the important thing to hear about the accident that happened in that little dip, and the people who are here, and who walk across exactly at that place, young people, there's a bus stop there as well. You know, we could save a life in a short term. But, um, and I just wanted just a little bit more about the signage. Um, there are proactive communities uh, where 
variety of efforts for its signage have been taking place. I think Stowe Street is a good example. We've talked about it, and I think it is in the future plans to have uh, some kind of paving difference down there, or at least discussed. Um, but they put up the, privately they put up the little signs that say, drive like your kid lives here. They do different campaigns. Uh, I drive Moscow Road daily, sometimes twice a day. Ongoing struggle there. Um, and they do things. Uh, sometimes I come and I see a sign that flashes my speed. Another time I see a sign that flashes, uh, please drive 25. Um, and they're different signs. I mean, maybe the solution when we have something on Stowe Street, we have something up on Guptal, are those portable signs that you put up and you flash at people for a while, and then you move them to the other place and flash for a while, and you do, uh, you know, what it takes to impact. Because, yeah, there is fatigue by the driver. They say, oh, I'm gonna, then later they, I agree with you, that happens. But I don't agree that that is something that is inevitable and should be our focus. Our focus should be on how can we impact them, how can we continue the impact, uh, what signage can we move forward with. And, uh, you know, I'm really embarrassed to be back again. I assured folks that no, I, I think they hurt us. I've seen this done before, it's gonna happen. And um, I think at this point, you need to assure folks by going beyond saying, really sorry, it was scheduled this way. Um, you know, maybe it does make sense to wait for that schedule for that particular sign, but let's take some action right away um, in addition or, or whatever it takes to not be saying we're waiting for the state. Thanks. Bill, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Uh, I also agree with a lot of what the town manager has, has said. One of the things I think that we're not recognizing, there is a national epidemic of distracted driving. I don't care if you're driving at 25 miles an hour. If a dog jumps in front and you're texting, you're on your cell phone, you're on whatever, you're listening to the radio, you're talking to your wife next to you. Too many people drive distracted and I get disgusted by it. You know, I see all all time people, and the problem is, I don't think you can make every every road in town a 25 mile per hour road. I don't think that's that that's a legitimate thing. I think there needs to be some policing. I do agree that there needs to be some action, but I think we were probably assured by the uh, AOT that you know the project was going to happen this year. I just don't think it, it happened, and I wasn't on the board last last year, so. I, I can't say I was one of those people that, that, that heard you, but I do hear that something needs to ha take place. I also, as a response, you know, I'm very kind of responsible. I think Jane's idea was kind of a good one to find, uh, to see if we could pay in advance and be reimbursed to get things going maybe a little faster than it would happen otherwise. But I, I do think, as Bill Sheplock said, People dr drive to what they do, and I don't even know if you make the speed limit 25 miles per hour, I think you're still going to see people driving fast. I think you're going to see people just driving distracted, and if people drive distracted, that's when the kids are going to be hit, that's when adults are going to be hit, and that's when the pets are going to be hit. But a lot of us have to take in some personal responsibility is maybe the kids should be playing in the backyard, you should have electric fencing for your pets so your pets don't run out on the road. You know, it, it's all personal, some of it's personal responsibility as well. I, I just wanted to let you know since you weren't here at the time that in light of all those things, our original request was can we put up some speed bumps in a couple of different areas. We were anticipating with the construction that we'd have that much more traffic up, up the road and we were asking about how can we get speed bumps put in, can we put in drag across temporary ones, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and those suggestions are still there. Maple Street is a speed bump at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, can I ask a question back to a comment you made earlier about the stop sign? I'm assuming that's the one up in the center. That when can you talk about that conversation? Is that a, does the state have to approve any stop sign, or can we at any point say we believe a stop sign? Should, so, like for example, I was just looking at a map that Thatcher Brook Road has a number of homes on it. It's in the dip. And do we have the right as a, I'm just trying to understand what any solution might possibly be. And I understand that last time we discussed speed bumps, 
or not solutions that maybe we could even consider, but do we have the, the right as a select board to put in a stop sign at, for example, Thatcher Brook Road? Could we do that? I'm just trying to understand what are our limitations to try to curb speeding in that area? Yeah, I think you could put a stop sign at Thatcher Brook Road. Um, when I commented about the stop sign before, it was the three-way intersection coming right. up Guptill Road at, at the triangle right. um, going to Maple Street and then over to the to the um, all of them. Uh, and there was some talk about putting three stop signs there. That seems not warranted in our conversation with the state. Whether, can you, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a through road, there's a, um, I can't remember if there's a, is there a stop or a yield coming down from Maple Street like that? That's it's a stop. stop. Right. There's a stop there. But it's the people coming down Guptill from the post office and hit Maple Street at 45 and they're on two wheels. I mean, they hit that corner so fast. You got kids that are walking or pe even runners or pedestrians, not even kids. I mean, hopefully the kids are known enough to bike on them with traffic. But it's right. the people that are well, walking against traffic that are in danger because it's kind of a blind corner there. Yeah, I, I understand. And, and putting a stop sign on a, a road that is a is a through road is typically not something that that's done. It's just that's not how roads are designed. They're, they're not intended to to be um, signed that way. Um, you know, you must see it all the time. You come down um, uh, and Flats from Ripley Road, and you get to Shaw Mansion. There's a stop sign. It's Shaw Mansion, but. I mean, people, people through I, that I don't even know time. if most of them yield to I saw a yeah. woman the other day break through it. They just never even break through it. Right so, I go um, every day. But, uh, you know, so I, again, uh, I'm not going to apologize because we, we did what we said we were going to do. We, we submitted all the information to VTrans, and they said they were going to do the project, and they haven't done it yet. So I feel badly it hasn't been done. If you, I'll investigate whether we can buy that sign uh, and put it in and then get reimbursed. If we can, uh, we'll try to do that. Um, but I think that Bill had an interesting idea about looking into some signs that could be moved around. That, um, so in addition to the flashing one that tells you your speed, um, whether it's an alert thing, you know, Children playing in road, or you know, whatever. Yeah, the, the village. The village. That could used be used on Stowe a, Street too. I mean, they could be used in a variety of places. And the they, village used to have a. Um, there was a, a trailer that had a, yeah. one of these speed limit signs on it, and uh, it was moved around to various locations in the village <coughs> until one night a speeding drunk driver smashed into it. And, Told a bit, so. Um, anyway, Mr. Fishman. I have. I'm going to go to the other end of the road. Just as we come off Route 100, and a lot of things have changed in the last 40 years. When the speed limit was 40 miles an hour, and it was one house where Chris is. I was the only tenant in my house. Tanglewoods. Oh, Golden Horn East. Horn East. <laughs> Golden Horn East. <laughs> and Tanglewoods were high end, low volume, kind of quiet restaurants. Um, and now, when you turn onto Guptill Road, you have a golf course with steady traffic going in and out all day long. You have the Zen Barn that has a yoga studio with people coming in from early in the morning and then people coming for music and, uh, and dinner at night. Then um, next to Steve Guptill's house, he has a workshop with the uh, winner of the milk, mini milk ball trophy and their crew with their big vehicles and trucks and people coming in there all the time. Then you go across the bridge and Chris Vienne's, that was one house once, and now he and his business is streaming along with big trucks coming in and out, um, and there are kids and grandkids and more kids there, and the same thing at my house and at my son's house beyond. The density there 
is not 40 mile an hour density. I see on Route 100, there are places where it's 30 miles an hour, where there are fewer homes and businesses than we have on that beginning part of Gupton Road. And I submit that one of the problems up in Waterbury Center is the speed at the beginning of Gupton Road. And when people are driving 40 miles an hour, they figure they can get a ticket if they stay under 50. And that's how they're driving. The coming down that road at speed, then you all of a sudden you come up on very quickly 30, 25, and it's done. And then you, you, it's going too fast all the way through. And I think that slowing that traffic down to what it should be at the beginning would be very helpful. There's another factor at the beginning of the road. Uh, I read that speed test that VTrans did, and they said, yeah, we went around at 40 miles an hour, and we made it. <laughs> and that was quite a thrilling description. But I, I live really close to Zen Park. I would like to walk there. But even in broad daylight, it's scary. You can, there is not room for one vehicle and then having another vehicle coming next to it the other way and a bike or a person or anything else on that road. That road is so narrow, it's set, the bridge is uh, it's very, very narrow. And there's something about the way the railings are constructed, the cement footings for them come in further. So vehicles coming together, they're really close, depending on the size of the vehicle. A truck and, and a pickup truck coming there at the same time. Uh, you can't be anywhere near walking on that bridge. And one of the other things that's changed these current years is this whole health stuff where people are out walking, they're hiking, they're jogging, <laughs> they're riding bikes. <laughs> you know, and on those studies, as, as you described it, Bill, they're, they're saying, okay, yeah, drive your car one way, turn around and come back the other. The concern for me is you're driving one way and there's a car coming the other way. There should be a very slow speed as you get over that bridge. One of the problems coming from uh, Water Center towards that bridge is when you get over the bridge, the road rises and Zen Barn has a blind driveway right there where they get deliveries and sometimes there's a big truck there which makes it even more blind because the truck is right at the end. There should be something about being, not just saying narrow bridge, but having a speed limit there. Because the speed limits make it so that people think about what fine they're going to get, whether there's, there's a flashing sign or not. If it's a 25 and you go 40 over that bridge, that's a ticket that no one wants. Yeah. Well, I appreciate all of your comments, uh, Mr. Fishman. And, and um, you know, I think that if the select board wants to have speed limits other than what are there now, that you ought to authorize me to pay a traffic engineer to come and do a study, because I'm not trying to punt on this, but I've got the handbook in my file cabinet in my office about how you set speed limits. And if you're on a road, uh, and you've seen it all the time, if the speed limit's 50 miles an hour and there's a sharp curve ahead, they put an orange sign up with black lettering on it that says 40, which is an advisory speed sign. Uh, you can't write a ticket on it. It just kind of warns the public that this is a little bit out of the ordinary for what you've been doing. You should slow down. The book says you don't change the speed limit for that kind of circumstance. You don't change the speed limit for a narrow bridge. So if you want something other than what's there now, I, I have no pride of authorship, but if I follow the instructions, I'm a town manager, I'm not a speed engineer, uh, if I follow the instructions, the speed limits that I'm going to recommend are what's there now. I drive that road every day as well. If I see a truck coming over the bridge near Chris's house, I slow down as I come down by where Champney used to live to let that bridge come, that truck come across the bridge first. I, I get it. I drive that road a couple of times every single day. So the speed limits, I believe, are the speed limits that will be set if somebody like me interprets 
the, the, the law and the book that I have to do it. If you want somebody else, get somebody else, and maybe we pay them a, a premium and tell them what we want and get a report that says that. But well, Phil, I know I drive this stall almost every day, and there are times on Route 100 coming into stall where the speed limit is 30, and there's it's not in, in the lower village. It's just there's just nothing there, nothing like the density that we have here. Is so, density part of that uh, manual or that uh, engineering? Uh, I believe you you take driveways and things like that into consideration. Yeah, but you know the it depends on where you are on Route 100. Um, you know the state the state sets the speed limit on Route 100 in almost every place that's where it's the state highway. Uh, you know, we have tried, it, it's odd to come up the hill from, from uh, the mobile station and you go up uh, and the speed limit gets faster as you approach Ben and Jerry's and, and then it gets, you know, faster again after you get past Guptill Road. Um, you ask, well, can you make the speed limit stay 35 until you get past Guptill Road? Oh no, it's not warranted. You can't do that, and, and it is what it is. So, well, can I? I, I I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just telling the board that the way that I interpret the law, the speed limits that are there now are reasonable speed limits from what you can set. If you want it to be slower, different. <clears throat> um, you're going to have to get somebody besides me to do it. Well, I think that one that, as I was saying about what the speed you come into the road on, the speed limit is 40 on Route 100 with wider lanes, with with shoulders. We have no shoulders on this section of the road. I understand. And the speed limit is 40. It just needs to be whatever the next notch is down from that, and. Now, if we're saying that these extreme curves and uh, in other situations where there's no shoulder and there's lots of people coming in, um, I mean, we need to get it, you know, get it down to 35 in those sections. Any idea when the last study was done, Bill? Probably no idea. <coughs> I did it. I don't know. Oh, you did. I don't know. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. I, I think that it's well, I'm just wondering, uh, you, you know, this isn't an isolated area. We've all talked tonight about other areas. The other day on Neyland Flats, I was headed up to one of my projects. I have a CDL. I abide the speed limit right to the T. In fact, usually I'm driving under because I can't afford to lose my license because it would impact my business. So, But my boy was ahead of me pulling a machine there in a small truck and trailer. And... Uh, this Toyota pickup come down the road, and I'm telling you right now, if you weren't doing 80 miles an hour, he went by me like a rocket. I couldn't even get a plate number. He went by me so fast. And I said to my son, hollered to him on the radio, what the hell was that? He said, I don't know. He said, he come out of Perry Hill turn by Mark Davis's on two wheels. And you're right. There's people running up and down that road and walking all the time. And uh, that's why I said, if you could take the law into your own hands, you know, you might be able to curb some of this. But to Bill's point, the speed limits are set. There probably are uh, fairly reasonable speed limits. I'd like to see Guptill Road be 35 miles an hour myself, ideally. Uh, but the people, you're going to have people that abide by those rules, but you're also going to have just as many that don't abide by it. And we spoke to a few of that, you know, a few of those issues tonight. No one. Um, so I came to you guys probably, I don't know, five years ago or so, whenever that study was done. I don't even know. That long, I don't think. Was it that? A couple, couple three years ago. Three. <laughs> well, I don't know. It seemed like five years ago. Um, but uh, just a couple points I want to make are that, one, things have changed even since then. Two, um, you know, the issue has just gotten worse. Um, that initial test, obviously, if you look at the regulations, you look at how it's executed, is highly subjective. So somebody else could be in your same shoes and have a very different result, feeling safe at 40 versus, you know, someone else could be driving based on their style and their perception, awareness of what's going on around them, could not feel safe at all at 40. So it's a very, very subjective thing. It is, absolutely. Um, so <clears throat> um, 
I think that easily um, this board has a lot of power to make a decision here to lower the speed limit. You know, on the one hand, we have a totally different issue further up the road that's an issue of enforcement, people not following the laws. But here we have an issue on the first part of Guptal where we have a speed limit that we're saying is really not safe if people are driving the speed limit. The board limit. has no power to change the speed limit unless they have a traffic and engineering study that tells them what they should change it to. So the, the board cannot make a motion tonight to change the speed limit. Okay. That's what I just told them. If you, if you want to change the speed limit, hire somebody to do a study. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert, I'm not a professional, I did the best that I could. I'm not going to go out there and say, well, things have changed, I'm going to do the same driving that I did before, and if it feels safe to me, I'm going to put down the number. And I think if you drive 40 on that section, it's a reasonable speed. It's the people that are going 50, that's, right. that's the problem. It's not the 40 mile an hour speed limit, that's the problem. It's people don't obey the limit. Bill, can I, to that point, I just, uh, I, I just, I disagree that 40. So if you're driving a, a big, like Chris said, those guys that drive their trucks through there, CDL drivers, you're going 40 miles an hour right through that stretch of Guptal. I don't think that's safe. I think they should be going. To me, 35 is the upper end of that, and I think the reality of, the, of uh, you know, study. Back when I came before, I looked up at all the regulations, the studies. When you lower speed limits, people drive slower. You always have your outliers. That's a different thing to deal with. That's an enforcement issue. That's all these other methods. They're not going to stop. They're not going to slow down no matter what. Speed limits slow people down. They're going to slow the big trucks down. They're going to slow most people down. They're like, oh, 35. Okay, I'm going to try to at least keep slower than I was before at 40. I'll, I would slow down myself. Sometimes I'm going 40 on there. I realize, you know what? I'm, I'm just used to that. I need to slow myself down. I also, when I looked at those regulations last time I came, it said that you, the, the select board could motion to lower the speed limit down to 35, and below that was required the engineered study. So I guess I'm, uh, that was my, and I reached out to VTrans and all that. So my understanding is that 35, you can, you know, but beyond that, yeah. Um, so. I guess I'd just ask you guys to look into whether you can or what it would take to lower the speed limit initially, you know, on that first stretch of Guptal. Another question would be, is there, you know, because we didn't pay, you did the engineering study last time. Mm -hmm. Who is authorized to do this engineering study? Is it, is there any particular reason why you did it or are there other people that are allowed to do it? What's the rhyme or reason for how that gets done in terms of who does it? Well, I just did it as part of my my job. I didn't have to pay anybody else to do it. So, Bill, do you have any any idea what something like that might cost, or nothing like that? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the other question I had, uh, I know a while, just a couple weeks ago, there was uh, some conversation going around a little bit about the state police and. You know, where are they? We don't see them at all. Um, maybe you could talk to them a little bit more about uh, perhaps being on that section in Guptal there more if it's possible. Well, maybe you should invite them to come to a meeting and yeah. talk to them yourself. But I mean, I, they, they submit reports, uh, they're writing tickets, um, and uh, you know, I see them. You know, they, they, they still have the meetings up at the fire station? or They did last month. I don't know when the next one So the state police are having bi-weekly, right? Correct. They were, yeah. Yeah, they still are. Uh, over here at the fire station. And they're willing to, that's why they go there to listen to people's concerns. And you're more than welcome to pop in there on a Wednesday night, typically. Uh, 6 o'clock, isn't it, Gary? 6.30. 6.30? Um, I haven't made it to one recently there. I've been wanting to, but for whatever reason, just been too tied up. Um, I've been to a few of them already. So, I mean, I would start there too as well. I mean, go to them and explain to them what you've explained to us tonight. And maybe they'll, uh, they'll start visiting that section of town a little bit more. Before we go too far down the road of, you know, 
I need clarity and understanding as a select board what our options are in any situation. So the, the idea of a test, I don't think makes sense unless we can actually, if the test is gonna come back and say, you can't do anything, then I'm concerned about that spend. So I need to understand, I'd like to review the previous test. I'd like to see what our options were at that time. Um, I do agree, I, I would support a lowering of the speed of just the 40 mile an hour zone to 35. I think the more we can do as a select board to slow that road down, the less likely people are gonna use it as a pass through. My other comment is, if we do have the ability to put in stop signs, I think when towns grow, they all of a sudden have to start to decide how to control traffic and speed and safety, and it starts with stop signs, and then you turn to, to traffic lights, and Guptill Road is an example of the progression. I would be, if, if we have the option to put up stop signs to basically surround the center to slow the traffic through that zone, I would be a proponent of putting a stop sign either at Apple Hill Road or Thatcher Brook Road. And I'd also be a proponent of putting a stop sign at Loomis Hill. And I think if those are options that we can do, that basically a stop sign to me is even better than a speed limit. It, it stops traffic and then they have to restart. It resets your brain in terms of what speed am I gonna go? What speed is it between this and the next stop? So when you say a stop sign at Thatcher Brook? I mean a three-way stop. stop. Do you need Maple? Is it Thatcher Brook? What's the one? Yeah, Thatcher Brook's right by Grinder's Vegetable Stand. Yeah, that's the right. Stop in there. Stop in all. You're, you're talking about stopping traffic on Gubbs Road. <laughs> I am. You think you're here to scream yeah. tonight? You go. Shall you do something? Well, you say no. I would like to know why that isn't an option. Okay. Maybe we need to. We do need to have a traffic extension. You know, I think I think you've got to. I think you've got to understand what people want to be able to have reasonable and understandable rules and signage. I don't know of anywhere where you've got a through road that you're going to stop somebody to make them stop for Thatcher Brook. Road, the private road that has eight houses on it? I think his example is what what power do you have to put stop signs where? And he's asking the question. Well, I, I don't right. know, but I, I don't. Exactly. I would agree with Bill. That's not, I don't think that's, that's a reasonable place yeah. for a stop sign because it's a through street. I, I don't disagree that we need to if do something. If it was something. a T intersection, I mean, right. a, a cross it, intersection it, it, there, then I don't maybe. Think, I think but, it would actually be a problem. But a typically, road. you put a stop sign on the leg of the road that has the lowest amount of traffic. And if they're, if they're fairly equal, then you put four-way stops. But, you know, at... at uh, like at Howard Ave and... At, at um, Hill Street or High Street and, and Stowe Street, uh, it goes straight, does it go straight across to uh, where the phone Swayze is? Court. Swayze Court is? It does. That's straight across, right? More or less. So, I mean, you don't put a stop sign on Stowe Street to stop that traffic. It's just, it's not done. If you have, if you have a place like, um, Route 108, the Mountain Road, and Route 100, well, that's pretty even traffic, so you put a three-way stop there. But the standard for a traffic engineer is they're gonna do traffic counts, and if a stop sign is warranted, they're gonna put a stop sign that stops the less amount of traffic to keep traffic flowing. And that's, that's just standard engineering. And I think you'd be hard pressed, uh, and I would be fearful that if you put a stop sign on Guttel Road at Thatcher Brook Lane, or whatever the name of that is, that uh, you know, a judge would say there's no reason for a stop sign. Well, I think you have a room full here of people screaming at us. What the hell did you do that I for? I would say a more reasonable <laughs> area would be uh, Guttel and Maple, generating a three-way stop there, right on that at the Y intersection. Right so there where Danny the, Green lives, isn't there? A, yeah, right at Danny Green. Is that the one you were talking about? Though? Just a stop there on Maple, right there. There's, there's no, no stop. stop. There's a stop at Hollow Intersection, right? Sure, with Howard Ave. Howard, Howard Ave. Yeah, through yeah, that intersection. What's up? I'm sorry? I just going to say there's two stop signs at Hollow and Howard. Um, I've lived there for 30 years, and a few years ago, a second stop sign was put in um, at the corner of 
Howard and Harlow and, and Hollow Road by the Grange Hall there because there was a, I think there was an accident. People were, people were ignoring it. They were going through okay, it. But, I, but I would agree with you. The problem, the problem is, is, is at the corner of Maple, of, of um, yeah, in um, Guptill Road. Um, and maybe it's also reinforced by the geometry of the, the very wide angle turn. Mm -hmm. The down, radius is really wide, so you can really speed right around the corner. Coming down Maple Street, there is a stop, there is a stop, stop sign at yeah. right. Guptill Road. Yeah. But right. There's no stop sign on from the other way. The one coming from Howard heading to the post office. So right. basically, what you're going to do, you're going to stop at Howard, or the shop, the dip. You're going to stop there, and you're going to go. 150 yards down the road and stop again at the corner of Guptill and Main Road. Well, I'm trying to ascertain there's no stop sign there now, right? No. It's the just only stop sign is the one that's Maple to Guptill, right? Right. Coming down right. Maple. Right, you're coming down Maple and you get to the end of Maple, you hit that stop sign. The problem is the people coming from the post office heading north and then hit Maple Street, they don't have a stop. So they can either go straight towards Howard Ave or, or Hall Road, or, or they can hit the right and go out Maple. And half the time they're doing 45-50 when they hit Maple. And they hit that corner and they're squealing. And it's just, it's okay. alarming. I mean, but again, I understand, Bill, you're, you're, what you're saying. No, you cannot I control driving habits. I people. understand, and I, I, I guess if you put a stop sign there, I'm not opposed to putting a stop sign there. I don't think it's a, 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 the right thing to do, but the people, if the people who are driving 45 out of the, if you're right and they're driving 45 coming out of the post office, it's 25 now. Mm -hmm. Are they going to stop for that stop sign? Or are they just they're going to slow roll through? Yeah. yeah. So, but the best thing that's happened to us in the last month is that the fact that the culvert that was put in hasn't been paid. <laughs> <laughs> I come through there today. I know exactly where you're talking. It's all washed out right now, so they're slowing down to 50. Yeah. I mean, I suppose that's permanent. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is, is that there's the, the element of people coming over the brow from the post office that are speeding. I mean, and, you, and again, I, know, I understand you can't change driving habits. It's also the people that hit the Maple Street stop sign, and they pull off of Maple Street, and they just gun it. Uh, we, we can look uh, into yeah. portable speed bumps, too. Um, that would be great. I mean, I, that was my next question. I is how a permanent it, speed bump on that road for winter maintenance is very difficult. Uh, Maybe we can get portable speed bus summertime somewhere yeah. in there. Because you have less foot traffic in the wintertime on the road. Less right. bikes. Less bikes. Less pedestrians. But also, I mean, that was one of my questions is how, how did it come to, we got speed bumps on uh, Randall Street. Just out of curiosity, like where did the funding come for that? Yeah, and I know it's, it's a village, it's 25, there's a high quality area. That was a village there's, decision. Well, that was a village decision, but there's a, there's a speed table on Butler Street as well. Yeah. And, and, and those are the applications for speed bumps so typically. But in small residential streets where, you know, it's, it's a short distance and it's 25 miles an hour. And they so have sidewalks to be safe. And, we can know. look at the, into portable speed. So uh, again, the other day I was coming down, I was going up Ripley Road just past Bill's house. Yeah. And right there, there's a short section of pavement where Howard Ripley used to live. Over the hill come Five Star with a pickup truck with a long, quite long trailer. Yeah. And they were fishtailing. And they drove, and I was in my big truck, they drove me right into the ditch. Wow. I couldn't believe, I, I thought I was history. I couldn't believe that. So it's not just, it's not just where you guys live, it's yeah. everywhere. You know? It's ridiculous. It's all over. People need to slow down. I mean, I, I'm trying to do my part. I'm sorry. I don't, I, look, I have contact with state police. We've had the, the speed car out on our front lawn two years ago. One thing I did find, and this was going to speak to Bill, is that people will slow down for it and others will speed up for it to see how fast they're going. Like there's some animals that are like, we're gonna just see how fast we can get this thing going because they know there's no repercussion from it. There's no camera taking a picture yet, flashes, a little radar ball at you, but there's no, it's not taking a picture of me, so they know. So they're like, let's see how fast we can get it going. And then there's other people that are like, wow, I didn't see that. All of a sudden you see the state police uh, reflective strip on it and it slows you down. But, and it's coming again in a week. I'm gonna put it on the, on the lawn again. Just, and it, what it does is it calculates the highest volume of speeding at which times, and then they're supposed to send patrols at that time. But what we're finding is that 
highest volume of speeding is typically between 5.30 a.m. and 7.30 a.m. and then 4 to 6. And that's when we're not seeing the troopers. We're seeing the troopers at 9 a.m., yeah. 10 a.m., and we're seeing them at maybe 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Not during yeah. commuter time like they should. Right. right. So, it, I mean, that's much of that's good. And I also agree with Noah. I think, you know, if we did 35 miles an hour from the end of Gulf to at 100, it'll slow people down as they're coming up through. I mean, it's just a way to maybe slow them down another five miles an hour. So if they're doing 50 now, they'll do 45 as opposed to, you know. Anyway, thank you. All I want to say is that I've done some work, and I've been on the Regional Planning Commission, I've done some work with these regulations. They're intentionally vague to empower the local government to make some decisions that are the best thing for their town. That's why we have rules that are kind of big like this. In terms of the speed limit reduction, um, if Bill drove that road and said, you know what, feels good at 40, but you know, it feels a little better at 35, then you guys could sit here and say, we'll move it down to 35. If you guys, and there's no, nothing to say that Bill has to be the one to do the engineering study, or the study. It's an engineering study or a study is specifically the language. I believe, I'm pretty sure, based on just reading again the regulations, the five of you could, or any one of you, could drive down the road just like Bill did and say, you know what, I feel safest at 30, 35. And the number one thing it says in the regulations is public safety first. You've heard now from all the neighbors. I've got a petition last time from every single neighbor pretty much on Guptill Road. Now you've got half the half of Guptill Road telling you, even Chris who hates regulations telling you, <laughs> 35 miles an hour would feel safer. You know, it just seems to me that this is something that this body can accomplish without going through the engineering study in the state. Um, you know, we have one main person who's, for some reason, is not is against it because he feels it's safe to drive 40 miles an hour. Um, but it just feels to me like this is, should not be an issue, um, of, and it's an easy thing to do. We're not asking you guys to solve the texting while driving problem or distracted driving problem. Those are things we can't solve, but we can do little things to make it just a little bit safer and set the intention for people coming down. You know, we get a lot of visitors, tourists coming through. They don't, they have no idea what's going on. You know, they'll, they're trying to do what's right. If it's 40, they're gonna drive 40, 45, maybe 50. Well, maybe if the study was done in a truck like my big one, <laughs> fully loaded, yeah. Yeah. you'd have a different perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, get a few of you. Get, I mean, yeah. I'll volunteer to do the study. Um, it, that's my request to you is to you know revisit that um, and try to accomplish what the whole road is asking for. Yeah. yeah. So um, setting speed limits a guide for Vermont towns and um, you know so no we can't just set a speed limit at 35. Should the local ordinance be approved? Um, can a single speed limit, for example, 35 miles an hour, be established for all roads in the town? No. An engineering study would have to be done uh, to determine the limit on each, each road. What's wrong with installing a few signs where they are needed for whatever good they can do without enforcement? This doesn't conform to the law. It will breed disrespect. An enforcement officer uh, would be embarrassed trying to prove the case in court. When is a traffic engineering study required? to lower or raise existing speed limits. The study is not required to initially establish a 50 mile an hour zone. So if you want about 50 miles an hour, you don't need to do a study. Uh, what if the select board receives a petition from a significant number of residents demanding a speed limit change in a certain area? The law states the speed limit must be based on an engineering and traffic study. A petition may result in the survey, but the decision to establish a speed limit must be based on the results of the study, not on the opinions of the petitioners. Should the speed limit be set five or 10 miles an hour below what the investigation indicates to make up for a tolerance difference allowed by enforcement officers? No, the statute does not provide for tolerance. A speed limit set too low is not realistic and will not command the respect of motorists. So you can read it any way you want, but um, you've got to do a study. And um, you know it's supposed to be a non an unbiased study 
not done by somebody who wants to lower the limit. So Bill, I'm not, I'm not saying that you don't need to do a study, um, but what I am saying is that I question the validity of the study that was done. I think it was based on your own opinion of your driving that road, which I respect, but I don't think it reflects the actual reality of the road. The first consideration, I've had the same exact thing up that I was just reading, uh, safety, public safety is the first consideration you should take when recommending a, uh, a uh, speed limit. Um, your, your study, the, a traffic engineering study, which you can do, we can do, as the select board at least could certainly do, um, should consider surrounding features and other factors. Absolutely. Um, you, can make, you have the information you need to make a reasonable judgment in assigning a speed limit that is reasonable and safe. What we're trying to put out there is that 40 miles an hour is not reasonable and safe. I know you determined that it was not, but I'm just I'm but telling you that you disagree with that study. For, for high volume roads, it says monitor the speeds at which traffic, which vehicles are traveling. Do this by performing spot st speed study and recording the speeds uh, in the data field sheet. This consists of monitoring a minimum of 100 vehicles and identifying the speed under which most, and it says 85% of the vehicles are traveling. Experience has shown that a speed limit posted near that limit is safe and reasonable. So if you went out there and you did this study, it's going to be higher than what it is now. But that doesn't take into the context that as a community we're trying to actually lower the speed limit overall. So. I think what we're asking is to be part of that effort. Let's try to calm the traffic together. There's, there's several things tonight that came up that are pretty low-hanging fruit that we can do to try to lower the speed limit. Common to try traffic to, is one thing, and it's, and, but lowering the speed limit is different. I'm not opposed to lowering the speed limit. All I'm telling you is how it needs to be done, and it needs to have a study. And what I volunteered already was, don't have me do it. I'm not saying that because what I did before, it was a long time ago. Maybe it would be different now. Well, that's why what I'm saying you. is, yeah. don't have me or you do it. Hire somebody right. to do it. I, I, yeah, think, I, support I that think we've person. come around to the fact that we probably need to have somebody else do it, <laughs> do a traffic study. Well, that's why I asked how long ago it was, because it may be a difference in the amount of people yeah. that are now living there it versus it was, yeah. and, I think, and I think that exactly. the examples of uh, just the even the things at the beginning of um, of um, the road, also it's true. You know, there's a lot going on at the beginning of Cupboard Road that wasn't happening 10 years ago. So. Bill, could we task you to at least, I don't want to make a decision on going forward with an engineering study until we have some sort of framework on how much an engineering study. I don't think this is going to be a cheap thing. I, I, I'm guessing it's going to be between ten and $20,000. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not worth it, but I think we should at least have the facts before we yeah. should we should and take it up at another meet and table it for another meeting. Right. Again, we can't make any we shouldn't make any decisions tonight. I think probably okay. looking into what it would cost and maybe some of these other smaller solutions would right. at would least help. help. Uh, go ahead, your young lady, and then we're going to wrap it up because we got a long night ahead of us. <laughs> the next school tomorrow. Um. <laughs> So one thing I'd like to mention is earlier, um, one of you guys said, oh, like, um, if we install a flashing speed limit sign or, like, something, not everyone's going to, like, follow that. And, yeah, like, duh. Like, there's the rule followers and the rule breakers. Um, my brother's a rule breaker. I'm a rule follower. <laughs> um, but there's nothing, there's nothing more that I've ever learned from my family and from my school is doing something is better than nothing. And I feel like that something is installing something. Whether that's a flashing le speed limit sign, performing a study, it's doing something. And we should do something before someone gets hurt. And um, we all have fixed mindsets. And so I think, um, like you said, it will be a very expensive project ex um, if we decide to go forward. I was wondering, like, if there's one way, like, um, I know you guys have a budget, if we as a community could, like, fundraise or, like, support you guys and support the town in moving this forward because we do really, really want it. And it's something like, if, oh, if money's the problem, like, if it's too expensive, then I feel like 
we can fundraise and stuff. Thank you. Good point. Thanks. Good point. Okay, well, we thank you all for coming in tonight, and uh, I think we've got uh, your message embedded in our backside of our britches tonight. Um, and hopefully we can start to make some change, to hopefully get some people so, to slow down. So would Steve, would um, Bill get some estimates for our next meeting? Do, do we need to make a motion for the request of Bill to go to VTrans for the reimbursement idea? I'd like to. I'd like to make a motion tonight that sets the course for some action. Okay. Second, second, Mike. Uh, I'll make a motion for Bill to contact VTrans to see about, at a minimum, um, allowing us to move forward with the flashing speed sign uh, for later reimbursement for VTrans because of their timing. Second that. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Well, one other thing, I mean the traffic study that maybe you would get that you would get some estimates for. I guess I'd like to ideally also include um, a look at stop sign locations in this discussion of one at Maple Street. Maybe some recommendations could be made in that study too. By a abuse experience. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you Thank you. Be safe out there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we burned up the clock a little. Uh, So I guess we'll go on to some manager's items from here. And uh, first thing on that is the third quarter budget report. We should do this at least quarterly. Um, the last one we did was for the second quarter. There's not really too much new to report here. Um, we're through three quarters of the year. Um, as I've told you many times in the past, the revenues are skewed to the back end of the year. So um, it shows that we've actually collected more in revenue than um, the calendar says we should. Uh, it's at 79.56%, but that's assuming that all of the uh, taxes will be collected and there will be no delinquencies. So, um, just looking at the expenditures, um, if we were right on target, we would be at 75%. Uh, if you look over page three, the general government budget is at 75.58. Public safety lags a little bit because we pay the state uh, quarterly. We only pay half of the, uh, the uh, 365,000. We'll be getting the bill anytime soon now for the for the third quarter, um, and then that will be uh, right on target as well. Bill, can I ask you real yeah, quick on sure. page two? The can you? Remind us what the general rec program donation was. The 5250 at the top. Um, just a, a, a number of businesses uh, made donations to the recreation program in exchange for, like, um, I think the Best Western and Fairfield Inn both made a donation. Uh, we, we put their name on the back of the t-shirts that the staff wore and stuff like that. Uh, I can get a list for you. No, I was just wondering what that was. I... They're just general donations okay. for the recreation programs. There may, if Bill Mentor was here, I could ask him. Uh, we do get some money from Forward, who does the Winterfest 
uh, from time to time, so that they may have made a donation as well. Um, turning over to page 4 of 12, fire department. Um, <clears throat> we're landing here. Guy is here, he can talk about this. Uh, we're through 75% of the year, we spent 45% of the budget. Gary often waits uh, until late in the year to purchase new equipment because um, he likes to see what's happening with the rest of the budget uh, and making sure that there's no uh, unexpected things that come up. So in the new equipment line, we've only spent uh, about 8% when we should be at 75% if we were through the year. Also, the, the uh, principal on the debt is um, not not been paid yet, so um, you know if that was at 165, which will be in a couple of weeks. We'd be much closer to on target there. You can see up at the top, um, we've had a pretty good year so far with regard to fire pay. Um, the top line, the 26,000, that gets paid out at the end of the year and pretty much gets paid out. Um, almost all of that would be paid. And then the $62,000 is for calls, and uh, through three quarters of the year, we, we've spent 50% of that. Um, Gary may not have submitted the, the third quarter of payment request yet, though. So, um, but from what I have seen so far, and it can change. Call volume is way down this year. Kind of uh, Good. Uh, on <laughs> on a par for coming in lower than anticipated right now. Do you have any feeling on why? No. <laughs> I'm sure it's a That's the short answer. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, I was going to say, I knew that was coming. I think a lot of it has to do with, and Gary, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, and maybe it's just because I'm not sitting above the apparatus bay in the fire station like I used to be, but uh, when we were there the first couple of years, um, like you were going out three or four times a day for calls on the interstate. And I think that has dropped off considerably. It, interstate calls has dropped a lot. Um, but overall, even because I track interstate calls versus other calls, um, even other call volume has dropped. Our high call volume was probably five or six years ago, and it was 343 calls in a year. Right now, we're in the 120s. Oh, wow. If we hit 150, thereabouts, I'd be surprised if we went too far over, unless we have a big uptick. And, and quite honestly, I don't know why. Everybody around us, their call volume is skyrocketing. Stowe's is out of control, if you were to ask them. Um, they were at a record number two or three months ago. Uh, I don't know why uh, we have a drop in call volume. How was it last year? It, it was down last year from the previous year. Right. We have, other than... It's trending down. Correct. Other than three years ago, I think our call volume was identical to the previous year. Mm -hmm. um, without having the books in front of me, I wasn't yeah. really prepared to answer all these questions, but no, it's no big deal. Um, but our call volume has come down. So really, the only thing that saves you on is payroll, because right. everything else right. is, is, is established. Right. So you know, are, are less people burning real wood when the oil prices drop and they can turn on propane and yeah, our, oil? Our chimney fires really hasn't changed much in okay. 10 years. We really have not. I mean, we go to three, maybe four a year, um, but that's it. Okay. And there's a couple that we know we're going to every year. <laughs> could be, could be, could be uh, more updated homes, you know. Um, yeah. Also, we also have gone to more carbon monoxide calls than what we used to go to because homes are buttoned up so much tighter. So. And, and you know, it's good that calls are down, but as Gary said, unlike every other department in the, in the municipality, the uh, fire department's uh, payroll is a small percentage of its total budget. Yeah. Uh, you know. If we were a, a, a professional fire department, uh, well, we wouldn't have enough for one person. Correct. You know, and, and you know, listening about the, the purchasing, you know, Bill's spot on. You know, 
if, if I were to spend proportionately 50% of my budget, say new equipment line item, halfway through the year, that's a big chunk of money. And then 75% by now, uh, then something happens. We don't have the money to replace some of that equipment. So some, some of the bigger items, we, we do wait until further into the year just in case. But I can tell you I've done some projections uh, as I was sitting there. Bill's recently signed off on some purchase orders. Uh, the new equipment line item is going to come out pretty much right on tap. It, it always does. And, yeah. and that's so, what you should expect. so it's not a matter of, hey, we don't need it, and all of a sudden we're spending it. It's, it's, for me, it's a matter of weighing what our risks are. So I see on the news the other night that uh, Vermont got, I think, half a million dollars, or uh, they got a substantial grant given to them that would go towards fire departments and utiliz utilization of that money would go towards uh, equipment like uh, uniforms, uh, air packs, stuff like that. Uh, are you going to, are we going to see any of that? No. no. Uh, and, and quite honestly, it's because this is the double-edged sword. We're fairly well off here in Waterbury. Now we can sit here and talk about budgets and the economy in Waterbury, but a lot of those grants are kind of leaning towards the towns that have virtually no money. And there's still departments in Vermont that have old milk trucks for tank trucks, um, that have you know pickup trucks that are running big pumps on them, and they're, it's not what they're designed for. So the, those grants are usually kind of, although they can't go, come out and say, hey, you, you can't get this, we can apply. But when, when you're weighing everything, com us compared to a really small department that has two trucks, and one of them is an old milk truck with uh, crappy brakes, we're down on the list. Yeah, in my old job, we did a ton of fin financing grants for small uh, volunteer fire departments, you know, anything from building a fire station to equipment and fire trucks. That was just, in, as Gary was saying, in some of these small fire departments, boy, they're operating on a wing and a prayer. And, you know, it's usually based upon median income as to how, what, what towns will qualify and we're usually up, up on that level and we won't qualify. I suspect we've been there before too, right? Oh, there's no question. Years ago. There Years is ago. no question. So I'm uh, moving on to uh, page five, uh, recreation. Uh, the pool uh, is pretty much done for the year. We've spent 91% of our budget. Uh, we do have uh, winter uh, lessons. We have an arrangement with uh, First and Fitness over in Berlin, and we still are having lifeguards over there running swimming lessons and the like so the, the, this expense will go up a little bit in terms of the payroll there's income that comes along with that as well uh, but in essence we're we're through the pool season we're through the summer recreation program we spent a little bit more than we budgeted but we took in significantly more you can see that on the, on the first page if you want to look at the, the income levels i think we took in about uh, um, I think we're about $30,000 above what our expectations were for um, revenues. Uh, the rec administration on page six, um, I do it, uh, and it, it is what it is. Uh, I didn't do a very good job in terms of budgeting for the recreation director's position. Uh, he's a full-time employee. This was the first full year of Nick uh, Nato being here. Um, I know what his hourly rate is. I multiplied that by 2,080 hours and then added some for overtime. He's worked considerably more overtime than I had anticipated. Um, I told him it's been okay so far. Uh, but even if we eliminate all overtime from the budget for the rest of the year, 
that line item is going to push up toward 50,000, the, the top, uh, the top line there. And uh, I'll have to reassess with him um, what we can do. I can't make him a salaried employee. Uh, there's uh, new uh, U.S. Department of Labor uh, uh, rules about who can be salaried employees, and uh, he has supervisory responsibilities. He supervises the rest of the recreation staff, but it's mostly part-time staff, and, and I pretty certain I can't make out a salary position. And if you made a salary position, you know, and he's going to be working 50 hours a week, he's not going to do it for $43,000 a year. Either. So one way or the other, I, I was off on, on that calculation, and I'll, I'll try to make sure that we budget appropriately next year. Is this um, naive, or is it possible? You said the rec program had taken in. $30,000 more than anticipated. Can that be used for? Well, yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll all wash out. I think we're going to be okay. There's some other issues that I haven't gotten to yet, but okay. um, that one particular line item I'm just telling you, Jane, is. is yep, that's why it is the way it is. I kind of whiffed on that one. Okay. So let me know. Um, and then in the Parks Department, we're right on track for where we should be there. Um, and uh, I may move some of the, uh, I don't know where we'll end up with grounds maintenance, but uh, we spent, I told you that we spent a lot more on the uh, lights out here than we had anticipated. We didn't get that Volvec grant. We needed to change out the lights and then when the electrician came to change out the lights and GMP came in, it was like, well, you're way under code and we had to spend considerably there. So I'll, uh, I'll flesh that out before the end of the season. And then the planning department, no problems there, right on track. Uh, debt management, we're probably going to be a little bit over budget. Uh, we had a little bit more tax anticipation borrowing than I anticipated. But that's paid for now. I don't think we will uh, have any more of that for the rest of the year. Special articles, uh, page eight, uh, we pay all, most all of those in December. Um, and by the end of the year, that will be fully paid. Highway department on page nine, uh, we've received almost all of our revenue so far in the highway department. Uh, we'll probably be a little bit above what we expected because that line item, about six lines from the top highway, labor and materials um, will get some revenue, but it's interdepartmental, so it's going to get paid from, you know, the Parks Department into the Highway Department. Uh, so it's not really a benefit to the taxpayers, it just is a more accurate reflection of where expenses uh, are in the, in the different programs. On the highway budget, we're right at 75% right now, um, and uh, I expect save any real um, unusual happenings in the weather between now and the end of the year, we're going to probably come in pretty close to budget. And the library is uh, right on track as well. So the three operating funds, um, we are about right on the 75% uh, level uh, in general. So there's nothing really uh, Bill, what was the, uh, the contractor's line on highway departments significantly over? Just wondering yeah, if you know. Yeah, that, that's over mark right now because there's a missed posting. Um, that includes, uh, that line right now includes $10,000 plus, I think, $10,400 for two culverts that were replaced on Loomis Hill, and that should be out of fund 71, so I'll move that into that fund. Um, and that line item will be fairly reflective of what the budget was. Is the sand budget way down because we haven't purchased sand? <coughs> just or, just, just, just timing. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. why I figured. Yeah. It's coming in. It will be yeah. up there before the end of the year. I assume so. Okay. Um, let me hand you one other quick thing before we move on to uh, Letter B. 
So this is just a um, kind of a summary of the capital funds. Um, in the in the black font are the budgeted numbers. The blue font is my projections for this year. So you can see the paving fund started 2018 with a negative $41,190 fund balance. We budgeted to have $370,000 come in. We thought we were going to spend $628,465. And if we had done that, if everything hit that on the head, uh, we would have ended the year with uh, negative two ninety nine six fifty five in the paving fund. Um, revenues were going to be right on target. We're going to do everything we said we were going to do in the paving budget, but it's going to cost us less. <coughs> so um, we're going to have a, a smaller deficit in that fund by about eighty thousand uh, dollars when we get to the end of the year. And then the same carries across for all of these CIP funds. The critical number is, if you go to the right-hand column, when we started this year, we expected that the uh, one, two, three, four, five um, capital funds combined would end the year with a $30,537 balance. So we were going to be just above water in these funds. And you can see the budget was a significant deficit in the uh, paving fund, a, a less deficit but still significant in the infrastructure fund, and then small surplus in the highway vehicle fund, uh, a healthy surplus in the fire vehicle fund, and then a very modest um, surplus in the recreation program fund. Um, the recreation fund there shows you uh, what I just talked about on the, with the lights. We started the year with $2,200 fund balance. We thought we were going to get $80,000 in revenue, which included a $50,000 grant. We didn't get the grant, so our revenues are going to be $30,500. We thought with the grant we were going to spend $76,000. We didn't get that grant. Uh, we should have only spent like 46000 but we had to spend 62000 because of uh, those issues that we had. So the fund balance in Fund 75 right now projects out to 25428 um, Back to what you asked a minute ago, Jane, I'm going to look at um, the uh, operating budget for the Recreation Department. I may move some of the expenses for that project back to the operating fund because the, rec, the, the CIP was supposed to pay for the capital improvement, maintenance, and ongoing upkeep should be an operating expense. So that fund balance there may actually come up a little bit, but all the same, it, it was uh, higher than we anticipated. But it's looking right now, instead of ending the year with $30,537 in the uh, combined fund balance for the CIP funds, that we're going to have about $220,000. Now that, that could go up or down, uh, you know, ten or $15,000. But I think that's a fairly accurate representation right now of what we're going to be. Um, <coughs> and we still have a significant deficit in the paving fund and the highway infrastructure fund <coughs> uh, came up quite a bit. The highway infrastructure fund, uh, we had scheduled, I think it was $138,000 to be spent on a bridge on Guptill Road, Bridge 4, that's the Dr. Marty Bridge. I talked a little bit about that today. And uh, Austin Construction, who's been we hired to do that job has been waiting for some um, uh, materials and, and parts, something to do with the rail system. <coughs> They're not going to get to that bridge this year. So the fact that you know our fund balance is projected to be $164,000 higher than it, it was budgeted to be, 
$138,000 of that one sixty four is just that we didn't do a project that we still have to do. So it's not terribly found money, but it's the reality right now. So with that, I'll stop. Um, and Mark, you went out of the room. I don't know if you heard me. On the paving fund, um, we budgeted to spend $628,465. We're going to only spend five forty six six sixty three, but we're going to get everything done that we had in the schedule to pave. So we have paved Loomis Hill Road from top to bottom now. We have paved uh, East Street and Jenny Davis Road is scheduled to be paved next week. So those are the three major roads that we had scheduled to pave, and fortunately it cost us less to do those than we, than, than we had budgeted. It's hard to you know, uh, be wonderful if I could just say, well, gee whiz, we've got an extra $100,000 or whatever it is. Uh, I guess it's 80 thousand uh, dollars and let's just go pave something else but it's hard to do that a because you didn't tell the public you're going to do it and b you haven't done the prep work on these other roads to, to get ready but I'm, I'm happy to say that we didn't spend less because we did less we we did everything that we said we were going to do and it cost us less than, than that but we still have a deficit in the day so. on the on the cip what's kind of I know it's it's a float that changes yearly based on large expenses, but is there, I mean, I know I've been on the board for a while, but um, what's the expectation on like kind of a, is there a low limit for CIP fund balance at year end? And, you know, what have you seen as the highest and I don't know, where, where what's like, what's that sweet spot in terms of trying to aim for? Yeah, well, you know, there's there's been different philosophies on different boards. And as I have mentioned before, we used to have one CIP fund, uh, and it had everything in it. It was fund number 30, and it had highway equipment, fire equipment, paving, infrastructure. It was all in one fund. And Rebecca Ellis, and this isn't a, a slam, but Rebecca didn't like that one fund because she said, well, sometimes there's more money in the fund than you think that maybe we should have, and the board's tempted to spend money, so let's Let's divide it up, and we have five funds now. But we still do what we were doing before. We've got five funds, and one fund has $484,000 in it, and the other fund has negative $300,000 in it. And you know, so we're, we're, we're still doing what we did before. Um, I know that's not an answer to your question, Mark, but the 30537 that we were projecting to end this year with, if we had hit everything right on the nose, is probably the lowest it's been in, in quite some time, probably going back to the, the, the flood years. Um, I don't know that for certain, but that's my guess, and I can look at that. Um, you know, we've got a way to, to spend some of this more, and we can transition to the next item and I'm going to pass this out, um, and there's nobody here but Ian right now. So this is a two-sided uh, paper. Um, I'm recommending that we hold a special town meeting in, in November. And I know Mike at the last time he said that you thought that's too expensive. And when we talked about it the last time, it was because we were thinking of uh, buying a roadside mower that we didn't have in the budget. And we had kind of gone back and forth and, well, we could lease it, we could do this or that. Um, a couple of days after that meeting, Gary sent me an email and said, um, we've got a major problem with uh, the pump truck E3, uh, engine three, which was purchased in 2000. And, um, you know, it's scheduled to go next year. And we talked about that a couple of different times. We talked about it this year. Um, and um, so he's here so he can tell you. The last I heard, just to do the repairs on this truck that has been taken out of service right now is in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range was the last I heard from you. Right. And then uh, 
So I started preparing to have a special town meeting for that vehicle. And then when I got back from Pennsylvania, I was in Pennsylvania for a funeral over the weekend, I got an email from Gary this morning saying that the second 2000 truck also is having difficulties. And I said, well, if we've got to buy a vehicle now, and if we've got to have a special town meeting to do it, we should put both of them on the list. So I'll let Gary explain where we are with the two vehicles, and then we'll look at the, um, the two versions of the warning that I've got proposed, and you can make a decision. So I'll, I'll go back just a little bit so you have some of the, the backstory. Um, the, the two engines that, were, uh, that are slated to be removed from service, replaced next year, um, a number of years ago, one was in a, a crash on the interstate. It got hit by a tractor trailer, probably going too fast. Um, and that created a lot of damage. We fixed that. Um, and we were anticipating that that would be the first truck that we would get rid of because we were then talking about separating the two trucks. Um, separating them in terms of not buying them at the Correct, same not buying the time. same year. bought as a town and village. Um, correct. The village bought one truck, the town bought one truck. We, both entities saved a little bit of money by having them go through the assembly plant one after the other. Um, that's really the only savings. So we do monthly maintenance on all of the apparatus. At Main Street, it's done on the first Tuesday. That means the trucks are started, the pumps are run, the ladder is run. Everything that starts or gets plugged into electricity is run so that we know that things are operating and this last month they did maintenance at Maple Street and they found that the oil in engine three what we refer to as engine three um, was significantly high which made absolutely no sense and and I'm not a mechanic the level was high yes the the oil level was high on the dipstick coming out the end the engine oil correct talking about? Um, so I'm not a mechanic. I called our mechanic. And he, he went over, um, he's been very good, and he checked the engine, and, and, and pardon my lack of knowledge, I, I, they start, they run, I'm happy. Um, it had a seal go, and then the, a cylinder maybe inside the engine is cracked. To replace that engine in the engine, according to him, huh? The cylinder. The, yeah, that part of the engine. So was it coolant that got into the oil? Coolant and uh, diesel fuel. Bonehead gasket or something? Okay. So it sounds yeah, good. I don't know. Right. Well, it's I, a fluid of some sort that's not oil. Well, there was oil, there was radiator fluid, and there was diesel fuel. All in the in one. The case. Yes. That's not good. Correct. <laughs> so he initially told me it was how much he thought it would be. I went to Bill, initially, without doing any research, was going to be about $8,000, and within a day or so, that jumped when he found out what was really wrong with it. But and even at $8,000, my first statement to was, Gary was, not, can, can we take this out of service, and is there right. a possibility to buy a truck? How, how yes. soon do you need a truck? Because I don't want to spend $8,000 now on a truck that we're going to get rid of next Right. or whatever. So I found out that it was actually going to be over $20,000 to fix this engine. doesn't make sense. We're not going to get that, even if that engine was fine when we replace it. So it, it's foolish money. That night I went to a mutual aid meeting. Uh, I was talking to a couple people afterwards from Northfield. They said that the vendor that we have bought our last two trucks from has a demo truck that he's willing to sell. So I called him up the next day, got the information on it. It is similar to what we were designing. There's some things that aren't on this truck that we were planning, but there are some things that are on it that we weren't planning. So it's kind of a trade-off. Um, and I talked to him about it, and he said that he would be, like anybody else, happy to sell it. He bought it so that he could show it as well as sell it for somebody that needed it. The advantage to that is that 
we met with them, we identified, because it's just a plain truck, there's no shelves, there's no trays in it, um, there's things that have to be added. Um, the advantage to that is, it's this year's model, and it's significantly cheaper. Uh, I went to Bill, told him about it, and recommend that we purchase that truck. Um, he is holding it for us, and I, I have all the numbers that I'll get to in just a minute. He is holding that truck for us until I call him tomorrow or tonight um, because he's got two other departments that want it. So, although I, I certainly understand the, um, the, the town meeting, the special town meeting, I'm fearful if we don't tell him right off that we want this truck, he's gonna go where the money is. And I don't blame him. He's a businessman. He has a truck that he wants to sell and he has two other departments in line waiting to buy that truck. So now I'll run through the numbers if you want me to on what we had planned and where we're at. Um, we had planned next year to order two engines identical um, and we were going to save about $25,000 per truck ordering them back to back. Each truck with the savings is $512,000 Four hundred and fifty-three dollars with that, the savings. With the savings, so that's one million twenty-four thousand nine hundred six for two trucks. With the first engine, engine three going down, his he does have the truck. The MSRP is five hundred and thirty-four thousand, but he wants to offload it because he's paying for that truck out of his budget. And we can get it with all the things that we've spec'd for that truck um, for 461395 So it's about $73,000 savings on that one truck over waiting until next year. You're talking about the demo truck. Correct. Then our second engine that we moved up to Maple Street it, and, the, and the demo truck is just a truck that he's bought and he, he takes around and lets people. Correct, it's correct. Not, it's, not, it's, it's got, it's it's got, got it. No, it has not been to any fires. It, it has literally, he just bought it on a whim thinking maybe somebody would want to buy a truck if I actually took one to them as opposed to taking them photos. Um, and the fact that he wants to sell a truck. Um, so I recommend it to Bill that we get that truck. Uh, we're going to save a lot of money. It's a truck that will serve Waterbury just as the other trucks would have that we had planned. Um, you know, they're minor things. It's, it's a little bit longer. Our new stations can accommodate that. It's a little bit higher than what we had planned, but we can accommodate that because the doors are bigger. It has a, f a front suction as opposed to a rear suction, meaning Typically, we pull up and we either hook into one of the two sides and bring water into the truck, or we pull into a long driveway and we put a, a portable tank behind it and we draft in from the rear. This one has a front suction, so we just change our process a little bit and the truck can, we can put the tank beside it and run the hose out from the front. A lot of things that we can just adjust how we operate, it's no big deal. Doesn't, doesn't shorten your distance of capability to get to a, a fire, in other words, you know what I mean by, by having to switch? No, no, because the, the, the suction hose that we use is flexible. It used to be very rigid and you couldn't, but now with the, the hard suction, that's what it's called, um, is very flexible and we can put a portable tank right next to the, the typically the passenger door and just put a couple links of hard suction on and bend it right around the corner so it, it doesn't change the distance in where we can get to it just changes how we would use portable tanks because if we're going to use a fire hydrant we're going to use a fire hydrant that will not change anything um, this is really just about more rural firefighting than anything else um, What's the life expectancy of these trucks? 20 years. 20 years. And we almost hit it. <laughs> um, the second engine we sent up to Maple Street from Main Street, 
we knew that it had a water leak from the tank to the pump. It was a leak, but it wasn't an outrageous leak. And uh, to, re to fix that, you have to take the truck apart, pull the tank out, which is a large expense. Uh, you have to bring it to a truck manufacturer. Steve Guptel doesn't do it anymore. Um, but you literally have to take the top part of the truck apart and pull the tank out, fix it. Financially, that's foolhardy when we're planning on getting rid of it next year to spend thousands of dollars to fix a leak. Well, now that it's up to Maple Street, the leak has progressed. We can't keep putting water in it because there's a reservoir where that drainage water goes because we don't have the municipal system up there that we do down here. Um, so we have a, a well, if you will, uh, where the water that... So this is, a, this is, what he's meaning is there's not a sewer system. Correct. There. So here at Main Street, it goes into the sewer system. Drain went into oh. the sewer system. Up in Maple Street, the leak goes down the drain and then, then it goes into the septic system and... We have to pump it out. And, you know, it's... It, Ground water level is high there and everything else. It's probably a holding tank. There's, there's a holding tank for that water that goes in. Right. And we have Hardigan that comes about once a year to, to take it out. But at 750 gallons every week, they're going to be coming here on a regular basis um, because that's how quickly that water is draining out. So, right. and you leave water in it because if you need it, right? Right. You the, want to have a, the engine water, gets to the sea. You want to have 750 gallons in that tank. Mm -hmm. And if you have 750 gallons in the tank and the alarm goes off, you might have 700 by the time you get to the fire, right? Yeah, I mean, if, it's, if we fill it right now, uh, we'll be good through the night and into tomorrow. But later tomorrow and over the night, the next night, it's going to be pretty much drained out. And that one's the same age? It's the exact same truck. If you looked at them both, they're identical. So, it, so we're now running a truck that has no water on it. Um, so we have to make sure that unless it's going to a hydrant, hydrogen area, and there are some places in the center, um, but not a lot, that we have to make sure that a tank truck goes. Um, because that truck is virtually worthless as far as putting water on a fire with no water on it. Um, and it just doesn't make sense in my mind to fix that truck. That, one, it has to come out of service. It's going to be out of service for a couple months. And it has value right now because it can go to a hydrant and pump. It has value. It can go to a, a body of water and draft and fill another truck. It doesn't have value to make an initial attack unless it has a hydrant right next to it. So if it goes up off Loomis Hill, as an example, um, it's going to get there, and that tank truck is going to have to be right behind it, feeding it water as soon as it gets there, um, because it has no water on it. The next engine is coming from down here. That does have water on it. It's a 10-year-old engine. It's running great. We're very happy with it. But again, we're we're now dealing with two engines that are identical and identical in age and are very costly to fix. So I certainly would, would push that we replace the one engine as soon as we can. I know you're going to have a meeting and that's, that's your job to figure all that out. It's my job to make a recommendation. Um, I, I fear we're going to lose that engine. The, the vendor, when I was talking to him, he said, you know, I have, this has worked out well, I've already ordered my next demo truck. <laughs> so he has ordered his next demo truck. It's going to be here in June. It takes close to a year to get approval, order the truck, have it made, and get in and get here. We can cut that time significantly by getting that other demo truck. Um, and that town meeting, fine. It, I think Bill's right. It makes sense to, to do this all at one time. Um, and it's going to be identical to the truck that we're trying to get now. It just is an, a model new year newer, but it's going to look the same. Um, so with 
the new engine, which is a little bit more in, in price, the, the one we're looking at getting is 461 in change. Um, the other one is 489 in change. So getting both of those trucks would cost the taxpayers $951,040 as opposed to the $1,024,906. So there's a there's a there's a savings. There's you know $73,000 savings uh, that can go somewhere. Uh, but so that's kind of where we're at. Um, it's it's bad timing, but we also have the mechanism for some good timing. Uh, it, it, it's nothing that anybody could have picked up on. We do regular maintenance on all the equipment. And uh, one of my officers is the one that actually checked the oil the previous month. He said everything was normal. We run the, the trucks, we run the engines, we check all the fluids, and that was fine. And in a month, we ended up with a big problem. Is there any um, money that could be recouped from this old equipment? Very little. Seriously. Uh, one, the engine that we have taken out of service, somebody would have to have the ability to fix that engine. Yeah. Um, it's not worth a lot. And the other engine, somebody is going to have to fix that tank. We, in fact, the vendor that we use, we've gotten rid of our last two trucks with him, said, don't even ask. I have no interest in them. Yeah. It's, it's, they're not going to sell. We might find a, a small department that really is desperate, and maybe they'll get them both to make one. Parts. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really it. There's, once an engine hits 20 years, NFPA says get rid of them. Most departments, other than these really small ones, don't want them. And we have not made a lot of money off any of the trucks that we've sold. We sold one a number of years ago for $1,000 just because the department wanted it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, as I said, I was, I was away uh, last week at the end of the week, so I, I misunderstood Gary a little bit. What I've prepared for you with Carla's help is, is two warnings. Uh, and the difference between the front and the back side is that the front side uh, with the two articles talks about the fire trucks and uh, the roadside mower. The second one just talks about the fire trucks. But what I'm understanding now from Gary is that you don't think that he will wait until November 12th for us to have a meeting to I'm sell that truck. I'm fairly confident that he, uh, I talked to him tonight uh, to get the hard numbers on the other truck. And he said, well, I really would like to know because I have two departments that want that truck. He goes, I, I want to give it to you. I want to sell it to you guys. Um, but he goes, I'd have to really sit down and think about my money and my operation and hold off on it for a month. And then is there a 30-day delay after that town meeting? So that brings us into no, uh, December. Right. And, and technically, there is right. uh, that 30-day delay. And I know he won't wait that long. Right. Um, and I also wasn't uh, completely clued in on the second demo truck being not ready That's until June. Right. That was something that he also told me tonight. Right. Yeah. Um, but it, it will be ready in June because he's already ordered that. Truck. That's correct. If and we we would just put our order in, but typically I know when you know the ladder truck, the rescue truck before that, we made the decision at town meeting. The budget gets passed. We order the truck, and then the truck comes generally the next year. That's right. It's it's close to a year to get. A truck through the assembly line and to us. So, so you, you have a couple of options, I think. Um, to me, uh, for the savings that Gary's talking about, I think moving it up from town meeting is, is worthwhile. Uh, you're going to get far fewer people at the meeting, there's no question about that. Um, the CIP projections, this page that I handed out, uh, I know that 
all together, the, the CIP funds combined are, are less than the price of this truck. But the fire CIP right now has $485,368 in it. Um, and I think you said it's 461395 for the demo truck that he's got right now, right? 461395 So from us just looking at that one fund, there's money in the fire CIP to cover that cost right now. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, um, and I think that um, the laws sometime with regard to uh, doing what you have to do are, are a little bit outdated. I know that, you know, if we had a highway truck breakdown uh, before winter, it's happened before, we just, we buy a new truck. We had a sidewalk plow that broke down a couple years ago. Uh, we bought it in November and we went to the voters the next year and we just kind of rolled it into the budget and we explained to them what happened. I think that, you know, we've got two engines that are down, um, or one that's down and one that's less than optimal condition, um, and we're coming into a, the most treacherous time of year. Um, we talked about chimney fires, we talked about uh, accidents. Uh, we've got a contract with the town of Duxbury. They expect service for that contract. I think we've got to buy that that first truck, and uh, and then I think I would say you might still want to have the town meeting and get authorization to buy the second truck. We'd have to change this warning, uh, but. I'll just throw that out now and let you react to it. The upside of ordering that second truck is right now it's going to take him a month to, to upfit what needs to be on it. If we tell him that we want that second truck, it will come here ready to go in June, as opposed to it getting here in June, and then he's got to put the additional stuff on like we're doing with the current demo truck. So, yeah, but I, I think that it would be my recommendation for that second truck. I would tell them we're going to buy the first demo truck now. Yes. Get it coming here. It's going to take a little while for you to put this stuff on, I assume. Right. And then tell them, you know, as far as the second truck is concerned, we're going to have a town meeting. And no, no, he's, he's totally on board with that. Um, because it's not here yet, it's not. He's not paying on it yet. Um, he understands that we may want it, um, but we've got time for that because it's not too far into the process in Florida, where if we go to this special town meeting and then we even wait the amount of time that we need to wait, there's still time to add those things in because it literally is bare bones. Uh, there's no Class A foam on it, there's no trays, there's no shelving in it, there's no hose that has to come with a truck that's being sold as a brand new truck, no ladders. But all those things can be done after the, the period that we have to wait for that second truck. Uh, so that concerns me not at all, really, other than we're saving money by buying it. I, I can't believe the taxpayers are going to be too upset about saving money. I, I can't speak for all of them. I'm sure there's somebody that would be upset. Um, but as far as the, the other one to replace, um, having been the fire chief when we had two trucks within a couple weeks crashed on the interstate, scares me that we're not going to have fire protection in this community if we lose that one engine that's in Main Street. So, Bill, I'd like to ask you first, um, looking at your current projected fund balances here, all funds combined, you got a positive 225.26 after all said and done. 251.062, the blue line, the second line. Okay. 
So it's 225, 26 higher than what the projection of 30,000 was. Oh, okay. So um, if we purchase this truck, won't we be in the, so won't that column change to like a negative 260 or yeah. 250? Yeah, in terms of the overall yeah. uh, fund balance of these funds at the end of the year. Right. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it absolutely would. And I think that, you know, we talked about it earlier in the year, uh, I think we need to borrow for this, and I've got to try to figure out the article, um, how, we, how we would do it. But um, I'm, from my looking at it, I don't think we have much of a choice. We need to have a fire truck. We've got two pump trucks, only one of which is marginally useful right now. And waiting until June or worse yet, if we waited until March to make this decision, we wouldn't be getting a truck until December or frankly probably It'd not be until April of the next year. 2021. So yeah, I'm not disputing. No, no, I'm, I'm just, not disputing. I'm just trying to wrap my arms around it where we where we'll end up being here. Uh, so on the second chart, is there any? Uh, how, how do you secure, secure first rights of refusal without putting any money down on that second truck? Uh, the same way we had the last couple trucks with him. He'll, he'll give you. But handshake deal kind of or he is one of the few handshake guys left okay. uh, if I go to him and we have this town meeting and we get past the 30 days I go to him and and he knows we're interested in it um, so right now we have first option to refuse it and if come going into December it, everything clears and I get the approval then I will have a, a conversation with him and we'll make it a solid deal so right now we have that first option. Carrie, which company is this? It's DeSorci uh, Emergency Products. Okay, I know that. Yeah, um, and it's been bought out from Mr. DeSorci. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Garth Brooks, non-singing Garth Brooks, uh, owns the company, uh, and we have we certainly do our due diligence in looking at other vendors. But there's not another vendor that we've come across um, that will provide the service as quickly as he does. He's in St. Albans. We call him with a problem. No problem. I know what the issue is. I'll get it fixed. I'll send my guy down there tomorrow or the next day. If, it's, if the truck is redlined, meaning it's not going anywhere, he will get down there the next day. Or I have called him in the morning saying, this is what we had happen last night. And he's come down that, that next day. So the service to me is just as important, if not more important, than getting a good deal on a truck. He's treated us very well. Um, Dan DeSorcy before that treated us pretty well. I, I got no complaints. Okay. Thank you. I apologize for my ignorance on this, but uh, I'd also like a little bit more education. Just um, So is he a broker and he's buying this truck from another manufacturer? He is a salesperson for the manufacturer. Okay. So they have them all over the, the country. Okay. And then in terms of just understanding the ability to ever in the future or now talk about, is this the specific brand that you feel is the one that we wanted to go with because XYZ? Or did we did we look at other manufactured trucks? Can you just talk about that sure. process a little bit? So typically, historically, you you find a vendor or two and you say, This is what we want for an engine. Design it for us. And some vendors don't want to do that. They want to know exactly what you want and then they will design that exactly the way with what you tell them. Um, they have been very flexible up there. We had good luck with the last two trucks uh, that we've purchased, the rescue truck and the current engine that sits down here at Main Street. Um, and then when we get those specs, we then generic, we put out a generic request for proposal. And with the last two trucks, we've not had another vendor come close to 
what we paid for the current trucks. So I certainly, under these circumstances for this next truck, wouldn't even call another vendor because um, I don't know of another vendor that has a truck sitting there waiting. Um, not a brand new one anyways. I, we could talk all night about used ones, which is foolhardy. Um, and we could probably go out and look and say, okay, for the next engine, we are looking for a truck. But again, we're, you'd then be running the risk of one, paying more money, because he's, the last two trucks, he's underbid the other two, right. or the other vendors. And we would then now have a truck that is the same as the one that we're looking at getting. Can you, can you, can I go back real quick on the comment of foolhardy? Can, can you just uh, explain why you wouldn't want to purchase, say, and I'm just, again, I'm sure. just trying to learn and understand this. Yeah. Um, are there ever trucks that are five years old, 10 years old that hit the market? Where do they hit the market? And what is the foolhardy? Well, the, if you were to buy a used truck, it's, it's not going to be any newer than 10 years old. So you can buy some 10 year old trucks, but they're a 10 year old truck and you're then stuck with somebody else's problem. So a fire department's not going to buy a, an engine, keep it for just 10 years. They're getting rid of it for a reason. Um, and we don't always know what that reason is. So you're buying a used truck, it has no manufacturer warranty. It has- But we have bought used in the past, right? Just tower trucks. Okay. It, because I don't think the town wants to pay for a brand new uh, tower truck that is over a million dollars. Yeah, I think one of my concerns here is that, and it's not anything you've done, but the timing of them always potentially being the exact same time is, is one concern I have. Oh, I certainly agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, and you did not get a quote on the repair of the, the leaking tank? No. Um, do you I, have any guess on where that, what that would be? I, I do not. Okay. Um, you know, Eric, the mechanic, used to work with Steve Guptill, built fire trucks. Um, he explained the process of having to remove that tank. It's not something that he can do. It's not something that Steve Guptill can do either, I don't think, anymore, the way his shop is set up. Do you think it's thousands or tens of thousands? I think it's thousands. Uh, I don't I'm know. just wondering if we, but we can't even take that out of service to try to do that repair because then we would be down That's to zero. Um, okay. That's I'm just right. trying to understand, and, like, is there... If we, okay, go ahead. I'm just trying to understand if we pull the trigger on this 461 truck, if we, as soon as, if we were to procure that, if we should still send the other one out, if it's thousands, to get back to a two truck scenario. Right. Well then my question too is um, if you if we go ahead get the go ahead to order the second truck the four sixty one, which I think is what it was, um, would you then be able to limp along until yes. June? Yes. If so you, yeah. Hopefully if we were to get that problem. right. If we were to get that other truck, that's going up to the Maple Street station, the brand new truck. The other truck that's leaking water we would bring back down to Main Street and we could continue to fill it every two or three days right. because the water is not filling up anything. It's going right into the drain, right into the, the, the sewer system. Mm -hmm. So that concerns me less. We have people at the station periodically. They can, we can continue to fill that truck. Um, and it's the way we operate that truck feeds the first engine that gets there unless we're at multiple calls, which has happened. But we can keep water on that truck if it's at Main Street. I just am apprehensive about putting water in that truck every couple of days at Maple Street and then having Hardigan come here every week yeah. or two. No, but, that's but would you have to do that between now and in June? Would you have, where, is it, where would that truck that leaks live between now and June? Could it be in Main, Main Street? Street? Yeah, okay. Well, well no, between yeah, now. Maple Street until we right. get the, the new one, which is no, first of November. So it's going to be up there until the first of November without water. And okay. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, and then when that new truck comes in, it goes up to Maple Street. Mm -hmm. And that other truck will come back down here to Main Street and it can sit there and leak. Um, we'll just keep putting water in it. Okay. But I, I, back to your question, yeah. 
We're not going to get a lot of money out of that truck, and I guess we could research it a little bit. And but where's the cutoff when you're not going to get money out of it just to sure. put money into it? I think it's twenty-five thousand per year is what I calculate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you another stupid question, and again, I was just trying to understand stupid. the scenario because I know. It sounds like years ago, the reason why we, how many other towns, I guess, of our size are running this dual setup of two fire departments with two pump trucks? I mean, are, are we, are we somewhat of a, of a, and maybe, maybe this question is completely naive of myself, but just trying to understand the scenario that we're in of, we were a village, a town, we have these two, now we're back in one. Um, how many other towns this size are running this much equipment, and is are we it, are we just as big as we should be, or what, how can you just explain yeah. that a little bit? Um, so there was there's been a village department since the eighteen hundreds, and people in the town, Waterbury Center area, uh, in the the fifties, whenever it was that they started, knew that they were not getting the quick service and speed has a lot to do with what you can save. And so some people up there got together and they created a, a fire department. And it was a private organization, which over the years morphed into uh, a town department. And there have been studies, there, I think there's been three studies in my time that I recall, where the question has been, do we need this equipment? And the answer has always been, you don't need it if you don't want to provide the service. So if you decide to cut back an engine, you're going to lose some service someplace. But didn't we, when, when we merged, didn't one truck go away? One truck from Maple Street went away. It was, a, it was for the lack of a better phrase, it was a bread truck. Uh, so we got rid of a mini pumper and right. uh, two, vehicles. two vehicles, and we got one which is the mini pumper. So we did lose, through the merger, one vehicle. But every study that we've seen has suggested that we can't get rid of an engine. Um, I, and the only other trucks that we have are, uh, that were, there's duplication are the tank trucks. And in a town this size, you need both those tank trucks if there's a fire outside of a hydrant area. And then all the others are specialty trucks. So Gary, uh, another way to ask the question, and we had this discussion back in 2009, 10, 11. How many other towns, Yeah. Sorry. 5,000 or so people, or even bigger, have more than one station? Um, in this area, Middlesex has two stations. They're significantly smaller than we are. Their, their land area may be comparable. I really don't know. Their department is significantly smaller. Uh, East Montpelier has two stations. Stowe does not. Stowe chose not to. Um, they had talked at one point to put a station on the mountain road, and they didn't want to, the, the, the fire department itself. Um, Essex has two, two departments, two stations. Um, Underhill Jericho has two stations. So they've spread them out based on the geography of their towns for the, the quicker response. And uh, I'd assume that, because I guess we're looking at it, say, say we're going to spend a million dollars. It's about $50,000 per year, I think, over the 20 years of just expectation of cost, only specific to the pump truck. Yeah. So as we... I guess one of my questions I'm going to have to Bill is this, um, the barring not to exceed five years, um, you know, the amortization of that spend is tightened to five, even though its life is hopefully 20. Right. Um, and just trying to understand what our options might be surrounding that. And then, of course, I have a concern of, are we over-equipped? I, I understand the, the scenario that we've had. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand that, like, these are huge expenses. These are significant um, costs to the taxpayer, and just you know, are are we a somewhat of a, a, a 
I guess, have we ended up here because of the separation of the village and the town and understanding um, any options we have there. And, and of course, it's always, I think, going to be a difficult decision if you ever had to make a decision to say, well, we're going to go down to either decrease our equipment size or go down to one station. Of course, I would expect that our ability to be at the level that we are now, but is there is there ever a consideration that we should make as affordability becomes an issue? So I'm just, I'm not trying to judge that in any way. Um, Reasonable. Yeah. I think, you know, um, you, you, I think you were around, Mark. Uh, you weren't on the board. Chris was very involved in the uh, <clears throat> discussion about the fire stations. Um, we had a bond vote that was, it passed and then it was rescinded. That kind of the same thing happened with the municipal building. That seems to happen fairly regularly. But in that whole scenario, and Chris can speak to it better than I because I wasn't on the committee, <clears throat> they looked for a location where we could have one station. Uh, I know they looked at the property that Joel Baker has on um, uh, Room 100 with the, whatever the gym, whatever he calls that place now. But we did look at one station, and if we had one station, would there be a difference in terms of the equipment that we had? And, and the determination was it's not feasible for one station. There were issues. There was, you know, you didn't have either water or sewer at that location, and that was problematic. Um, and, and we did time trials. I mean, there were a lot of people involved in time trials. They, they picked sporadic places throughout the town and literally drove from different members' houses, so we got a good blend, to the fire station and then to those uh, locations, out of both uh, locations. And then they did it based on single locations. And the time dramatically increased, more than doubled, if I recall, um, the response time. And so th there's, a, there's a huge trade-off. Mm -hmm. uh, right. you know, really, and contents fire becomes a whole house fire. And, and certainly, uh, as I said, I know <clears throat> that we reduced the number of vehicles. We did. Yeah. When we when we merged, it was not just when we built the new fire stations. It was when when we merged. Prior to merging, it, it took um, a little time. Prior to, to the new station, but right. as those trucks came, time to trade in. We didn't buy two. We bought one. We right. got a real rescue vehicle as opposed to the other thing. We got a pump, a mini pumper that can do something. So I, I think we've looked at the the vehicle number. Right now, do we just, we have two pump trucks or? Three. Three. Not counting the, the mini Right, bunker. not counting right. the So there's. We've got three. Right. And the third one is scheduled Six. when? Five Another years ten, years. Now, ten years. Ten years. Ten years from now. So we have three vehicles because we bought two as, a, you know, the town and the yeah. village bought two at the same time. So we've got a cycle of the pump trucks of of 20 years, but two of them, and then 10 years later, there's one. And ironically, th these are the two that we were discussing last January, I guess, to replace, and we decided to put it off. Yes. Right. We uh, talked about so splitting it up then, right. doing one this year and one next year, and then we talked about, <coughs> well, if we just save a money. little bit of savings to buy two <laughs> at the same time. We saved money by not doing it. We saved that. money by not doing it, which is, fine and I think that um, you've come up with um, a solution to your quandary um, you know which saves actually a little bit more this it, it one, actually does this it, one that you found it, 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 that would be available if we were to con if we didn't have any problems with our engines and we continued with the plan for next year we're still saving more money right. than what we would be next year yeah and, and to your question about the funding, Mark, um, so I don't have it with me right now. Um, we bought, you know, we've got a we've got a pretty big fleet of trucks, 
And th this paper that I just passed out, you'll see on there that there's uh, the, the pipe information is the debt service, the principal outstanding of all our loans as of uh, December 31st, 2018. And then the handwriting is what's going to be paid, well, not what's going to be paid down, what the balances will be at the end of this year when we make this, the payments on these loans this year. So you can see that we've got a ladder truck there. Um, at the end of 18, we owe 292,500. When we get to the end of this year, we're going to owe 260,000 dollars. What do you know? What time frame that's on? What do you mean? Is that a time 10 or a five or amortization schedule? Um, that is 10, I believe. Yeah, um, because it's oh, it's right, 12,500 a year at the time. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, we kind of, we have a number of vehicles that are all kind of coming together uh, at different times. So we kind of have this rolling schedule. Now, if I could have a town meeting and authorize us to borrow the money for um, more than five years, I, I, I would do that because you're exactly right. Um, this is a lot of money. We don't have the money inter <coughs> to borrow interfund for, for $950,000. We can't borrow from ourselves right now. Uh, so the ladder truck, I believe, if I go back and look at the, the warning that we have on the ladder truck, is that we ask the voters to allow us to borrow the money over 10 years because we're borrowing it from ourselves. So technically, we're not, we're really not borrowing it. We're just borrowing it from this fund. Um, to have a vote at town meeting that isn't a bond vote, the longest you can go out is five years. So if this were to pass, if, and I, as I said, I thought we would be waiting until November, getting authority to buy both vehicles I think 950. We're going to be a little short of that if we if we did it because the second truck is a little bit more expensive. Um, if we actually did go out and say borrow from the People's United Bank, uh, I think I would recommend to you the same thing that we did with Perry Hill Paving when we borrowed five hundred thousand dollars there in 2014 for five years, and then we went to the bond bank and refunded the note and then spread that over 10 years. Uh, you, can, you can do that. You can't have a, you can't go beyond five years though if you're just going to do it from a voice. So account. in those scenarios, there's a balloon at the end of five years? Yeah, that that's what I was thinking. Five year balloon. Financing it? No, so what we, what we did it's with, the same thing. what we did with the Perry Hill bond was we borrowed $500,000. The next year's budget, I believe, I bu we budgeted nothing uh, to pay to pay in that year, and then we just we the select board on its own motion can turn a note into a bond, and then we went over we went for ten years on that. Oh. So, in fact, we it, so it actually we amortized it I think over eleven years. Well, maybe we actually borrowed 450 from the bond bank and you know paid, mm -hmm. paid one tenth of it ourselves that way. So and on this, this is the thing, why do you refinance it to? Why why do you do it twice? Better rates. You get a better rate the second time. The you don't get a better rate. You just well, you, you can spread it out over a longer, you know, longer, longer, longer period of time if you go to the bond. But why don't you just do that in the first place? Can't. Because we'd have to have a bond vote, and it's much more complicated. Okay. Than just <laughs> got it. Got it. <laughs> um, did you say there's a third pump? Pumper? Or yes. a third yes. one? Okay. Yes. And we're, so we'll, that has to be. That That's good. 10 years, 10 more years okay. left. How come we have three M this morning again? I just... So prior to the merger, the village department had two engines because that's we covered not only Waterbury, but we covered Moortown, part of Moortown, and Duxbury. And it, it, the, the first engine 
in theory, goes directly to the fire. The next engine comes up with additional people, connects to the hydrant, runs the hose to the, to the engine. Um, it also is there when there's more than one call, and we have certainly have seen that. It also provides us with a little bit of insurance in the event that something happens. In this case, right. it wasn't enough insurance. Um, but we, like I said, uh, it was probably six, seven years ago, and we were on the interstate. The interstate turned to ice. We were, I was in the engine, and we had our best driver, most conscientious driver, and we hit uh, ice on the interstate above the Bolton Falls. And the truck spun around. We hit the Jersey barrier. It caved in the corner. It was about $24,000. It was out of service. We still had a truck that we could operate with. Two weeks later, we were at another crash. A tractor trailer came around the corner too fast, jammed on its brakes. The box slid in and narrowly missed one of our people and hit the truck. So we then took a fire truck from Maple Street because they still had a mini pumper and we brought it down to Main Street. So there's some juggling of trucks. But we wouldn't be able to do that if we eliminated one. And the way it, we operate, I mean, it, if you have a big building fire, it takes more than one engine to operate yeah. that fire. So moving forward here on the decision as to whether, I mean, making the decision as to authorizing the immediate purchase of the first truck. Um, to rewrite the uh, article for a special town meeting, would you somehow put in there that uh, that we're taking from the CIP for the first truck and some of the money based on the way the CRPs are set up, we would be essentially taking the money out of the CIP out of the highway infrastructure for the bridge project to kind so of fatten up the fire vehicles. So we kind of have to replace think, that money. I think you have, you have two options. Well, I think the first thing you have to decide is if you're going to buy any truck, a brand new truck, without the benefit of a town meeting. I think that we're in a situation that you should do that just for the public safety reasons. Uh, you know, we've, we're, we're essentially down to one pump truck right Correct. now that's fully workable. Um, and if you can get it back to Main Street and let the water go down the drain, it's better than what we have now. But I think you have to decide whether you're going to buy a vehicle without the benefit of the town meeting. Uh, we did it a couple of years ago, as I said, for the for the um, sidewalk plow. That was like one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars or something like that. It wasn't four hundred and sixty-one? It was one hundred and sixty, but it still was a major purchase. Um, if you do that, and we just we pay cash for it now, and then we can. Um, amend this article if you're going to have a town meeting in November, ask the board for the authority to buy um, and finance a truck for 489000 or I, I would say five hundred, just to make sure we cover the base. And then uh, you could ask for um, the voters to authorize borrowing, additional borrowing to to finance the, the emergency purchase that was made uh, in November. I mean, to your point, Mark, uh, well, we're in a scenario here where we've got one truck that's uh, one truck that's completely, virtually completely crippled. I think it's giving us a sign there that it's getting late. Uh, one truck that's virtually crippled and another one that's half crippled. Um, 
I, I'd say one is more than crippled. At least you could function with it. This is literally we've stripped it down. There's nothing on it. It it won't run. It'll maybe go down the street, but it doesn't sound good going down the street, and it may not go down all the way down the street. But anyways, I, your point being, so we've got two trucks that are on the verge of having to be replaced. We knew that last budget season. Um, if we move forward with the immediate emergency purchasing of the one vehicle, set up the special town meeting, then the voters will decide then whether they want to purchase a second pump truck or not, right? So, well, like I said, that that'll, that'll be left to build because we're making the decision to potentially spend 461 that was not in this year's budget. So even if we emergency pull the trigger on this one it's really what's the follow-up to that do we go all the way until next town meeting to to really talk about the borrowing for that or we still have to talk about the borrowing for that i, right? would, I would do it at, at the special town I would meeting do it at the special okay. town meeting in okay. that and that's where you'll resolve that issue along with the issue of the funding for the second one as well and the voters instead of instead of us having to put it in the budget for March, it'll be an early town meeting discussion and at that point that the whole thing will get resolved. So either either they you know, either they'll vote down the they'll vote for the spending to reimburse for the emergency spending and vote down the spending for the second truck until a later date or vote to purchase both. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask another question. I, I, I think personally I, I'm supporting this, especially if there's a seventy thousand dollars savings. Um, finding out that I, now that it's a little clearer that there are three of these trucks, what's the risk on repairing the one truck with the leak after we get this new truck and having that as a backup and letting that go past the twenty years and not necessarily pulling the trigger on another five hundred thousand dollars? I mean, I understand that it's at its end of life, but each one of these trucks is going to cost us approximately twenty-five thousand dollars a year of just depreciated expense. We're buying something five hundred thousand; it's going to zero. We obviously are learning that these are going to zero, um, so that's basically twenty-five thousand dollars a year. So, I mean, I back to the question of just you know how much equipment do we have? These are huge expenses. If if the ongoing maintenance expense exceeds $25,000, yes, I think. And then, of course, safety question marks, and I understand age, but I'm just trying to get a little up big, more understanding of, I definitely understand that we need one right away. Um, but the second one next year that potentially, we basically, by not making the decision last year, saved $50,000 in a single year. Um, we actually now, because of this scenario of the demo truck, I think there's a couple scenarios that I think we could, is the 489, is that the demo truck for next year potentially, but he would equip it how we potentially would want it? What was that 49 for the second truck? Yeah. That, is the, that is the next demo truck. And that would be, there's a, a list of equipment that's going on, the first one. Yeah. Putting that same list of equipment into the okay. next one. And he would be willing to take that risk of equipping that and not knowing that, not knowing whether or not we'd be buying that truck, but potentially by us going back to him and saying, "Hey, there's some timing with a vote. Maybe we can make that decision tonight." Yeah. But I, I don't know, yeah, because I did not talk to him about whether or not we have a town meeting in March, whether or not he would hold that because there are other departments out there that are right. are starting to see the. The good idea. But we're talking so, about November. So, we might be voting in both, so, so he might have to wait for the second one in November. No, I think he made right. it clear that he would. He's a, got a hand on a handshake. If we could confirm this in November, you could work a if deal. We, if, we, if, we, if this passes yeah, in November, November said that, yeah. then but, that truck's ours. Right. So is is your the question before this exchange? Um, if we could fix the leaking tank. Okay, so we've got three vehicles. Right now, we've got two going in 2020. That was the anticipation. One going in 2030, and then it would be two in 2000, 
40, right? I won't be here. <laughs> so could, if you fix the tank, mm -hmm. the leaky tank and the one that's up at Maple Street now, what's the likelihood that it could make it to 2025? And that way would have one in 20, that one in 25, the next tank would be in 30, and then would be in 35, I, and then would be in 40. Uh, there's really no way of saying. If I knew, sure. I'd be wanted all over the place to, to judge. I mean, we expected these two trucks to last past next year, and they're not. Um, so to, to say, okay, we could fix this tank. An engine's a big difference on that, a tank leak, no, right? No. Right, but okay. we're still talking about sure. risk. A, a, risk. Yeah. Uh, a 20-year-old fire truck that is already demonstrating that the, that the connections from the tank to the pump are no good. That's got to be fixed. And then what happens six months from now when something else goes? Do we continue to fix that on a 20-year-old plus truck? Uh, the NFPA, now we don't have to comply with NFPA, but if something happens, we're going to find out in court how much we should have. Sure. I mean, yeah. I it's a, I, I understand the decision that it's not an easy one, and of course you'd want to buy new on it. I think there's the difficulty I'm having with is, of course, a million dollars in a single year or close to a million dollars. But you know the the idea that the, the third how many I guess back to the question of departments how many other size departments have three pump trucks. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that th th I know the departments that have <coughs> multiple stations. I do not know what they have. Certainly, um, uh, Burlington, but they're significantly larger. Sure. I don't know that they're that much larger in area than Waterbury is. Um, I'm just wondering. You know, we we be able to get a brand new one. We have one that's ten years old, and then potentially, if this leak is not a tens of thousand dollar repair, that then that gives us a little bit more, you know, t every year is $25,000. So every year that we can keep that truck going that doesn't cost us $25,000, we're saving money. Um, I understand that there's there's a headache from that, but I, I think fisc fiscally we have to think about that as an option. I'm not saying that we should do that. I'm just, I think we need to talk through the scenarios. Um, and, and if you tell me that's crazy and maybe Chris who maintains large equipment like this on a regular basis can give a little bit more feedback on, you know, his decision. I mean, he's also got the same, not the exact same, but he's got, he has to make decisions based on risk and safety of his, his guys too. So I don't know, I'd be interested in, in maybe Chris's opinion well, on, on that. I, 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 I understand the, the question. Yeah, yeah. And, and with all due respect to what Chris does, his excavators, his other equipment aren't going to a building fire to maybe take somebody out of a building. Sure. No, I, well, so if well, his my excavator is down, <coughs> right. yeah. it's okay. Right. Well, it's not for him. It's apples and oranges in one sense, but it's apples and apples in another. I mean, my question, what's got me scratching my head is uh, this, this business of the fire industry that's been created over time, the manufacturers, uh, you know, is this is this equipment for the amount of use that it gets, it seems to be deteriorating at an unusual rapid rate. And I'm kind of scratching my head as to why that is. I mean, even the newer equipment today, I gotta tell you, uh, they're making them junkier and junkier all the time. Uh, so they don't hold system. up to like yeah. what the old equipment used to. No um, you know, I'm just wondering if are these things deteriorating, sitting in the garage, just doing nothing as much as they are when they're out being used? I mean, what's, for the for the amount of hours and the, and the time on the road, 20 years, I mean, these things ought to, ought to be lasting more than that, but for some reason they're not. Um, and then my other question is, 
I understand your point. Is that a question for me? Because I know it wasn't. I think I'd like to hear what he had to say. No, no, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, he, he can't answer that question either. Right. Uh, to your point about maybe saving the tank truck by patching the tank and getting a few years out of it, saving ourselves 25000 a year or whatever, uh, I'm curious to know what the additional increases in the cost of equipment as we go on, you know, that weighed against, yeah. Yeah, it's weighed against the, the savings. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, how, how, how are we all going to, how are we going to turn out on that? Um, well, I mean, and then you got, you know, really we're talking about a 512 next year. We just happen to have this scenario, this demo truck, this guy could move on in a couple of years and all of a sudden we're back to square one there. I mean, I totally understand those scenarios too. I'm just trying to understand a little bit. So, well, you've got an industry that has a limited market. Right. Okay. And these guys are quite honestly, in my opinion, they're putting it to us. They're putting it to the municipalities. Well, because, it's not because that's, that's their only market. It's government, it's, government. Well, it's, it's taxpayers money to some degree. And, um, you know, it's a niche market. Right. And it's, it's, it's not, not like buying a vehicle. It's not just the manufacturers themselves. So there's manufacturers all over the place. It's the different regulations that come down saying you now have to have these in your truck. Every year there is a change. And it's mind boggling. You know, they used to, the, the truck that we, before we had this one, probably the one before the one that's only 10 years old now. You know, it had a driver's seat and a, and a passenger seat. And all the firemen hung off the back of the truck and went to the fire. Yeah. And now you can't have firemen hanging off the back of the truck and going to the fire. So you've got to have a cab that holds six people, right. or however many it holds. Six. Um, and, and, you know, the, there's all kinds of safety regulations. And, you, you know, it's probably not a good idea to have four or six guys hanging off the back of the truck going to a fire. It's it's a good regulation. It costs money, though. Right. So I, I, I think it's a little bit of a stretch to say that these vehicles are, you know, they're putting it to us. I don't think the manufacturers are putting it to us. Um, we have uh, ISO standards. They come in. They evaluate our equipment. They evaluate our stations. That is Last I looked, we have the highest rating that we can have for a volunteer fire department. Correct. And, no. and, and by taking away one of those engines, that would skew that insurance rating. And then all of your insurance premiums are, are going to go, go up. up. Right. So it's, you know, pay the town for a good piece of equipment, or we all aggregately pay at least that much in increased uh, premiums for for our homeowners insurance and business insurance. So if you bring back a new article, rewritten the way you think that it probably should go, uh, can you have some figures there as to uh, what a five-year note would be and the expense on a tax rate uh, number? Well, and then you need that before you can sign the warning. I certainly have that stuff for the meeting, at the meetings, but well, what, what I'm bigger concerned about is a, is a five-year note versus a ten-year note. Um, well, we could explain to the You can only ask taxpayers. for a five-year note. Right. We can't. No, I meant for our information. Yeah, you just won't so be we, refunding until next year, so right. um, that's not a decision you have to make now. We could explain that in the discussion that we will be going to the bond bank for. Well, I, I, yeah, I just try, try to think ahead a little bit as far as what I'm looking at, as far as tax rates, if I knew, uh, yeah, I suppose it can wait till the special meeting. Right. Well, um, I mean, the, the math is pretty simple. If you, if you, if it's a million dollars and it's, and it's five years, then, you know, it's $200,000 a year, right? And just in principle. Yeah. If it's three if it's ten years, it's a hundred thousand. And it's a hundred thousand dollars a year. Do if that. it's twenty years, it's you know fifty thousand dollars a year. So three cents versus a penny and a half. Right. 
I mean, I appreciate Mark's questions and trying to, and it has been. All good questions. It has been educational, but I conceptually believe we, I, I think we need to just do what you're suggesting. I, I think it's good that we have three engines. I think it's public safety. We demonstrated there were, it was an issue and we were lucky to have that extra. So I think we need to. You know, in, in, I don't, I don't necessarily agree that we should patch up a, a 19, 20 year old, um, you know, pump truck. Right. I think we should buy a new one and we, next year. If and we it cost money, but I think you know we got a good thing yeah. going here, and I think we need to. Well, it is. It, it think is about a cost public safety. safety. And, and it I don't is think you're going to save twenty five thousand dollars a year necessarily by patching up an old truck. So. so and I'm not an equipment expert, but that's what I think. And, and I said before that I'm. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I also know, and I'm, I'm, we've, we've already asked the school if we could have the meeting on the 12th. <clears throat> um, you know, Carla's first question to me was, well, can we have the special town meeting here? And likely we're not going to get a big crowd. 100 people, but in case we do, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> but. Could do it at the fire station. I'm, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> no, no parking. I'm wondering if we can, station. if any of you are available for a brief um, select board meeting later in the week. We still would have a couple days to get this on the 12th. Um, I think we'd need to warn it by Friday. One, two, three. I could be available so, on Friday. Friday the 15th. <laughs> that's going to be that's a bad day for me. Yeah, we could. And, and the reason I'm reluctant, I know that um, if we have to borrow from a bank, and, and I just told you, I don't think we have the capability to borrow from ourselves. The village might be willing to, to lend us half of this. But um, if we have to borrow from a bank, they're going to want to see the warning and they're going to want to see the results of the vote. And I know from talking with Paul Giuliani, who's the bond counsel, that you have to have a, if we already bought the vehicle, and then are asking to borrow something, you're, you're basically asking to reimburse yourself. I'm not sure the bank will be willing to go forward, even if I amended this and I wrote it. So I, I guess what I'd like to say is I'd like to have a lawyer write the article that we're going to authorize the purchase of one vehicle, the, $489,000 vehicle and finance it and then reimburse, authorize us to borrow money to reimburse this emergency expenditure. I'm just fearful if we, if I just did it and then we end up a bank saying uh, that's, that's not a legal warning. I, I'm reluctant to do that. So what I'd like to do is talk to Paul Giuliani tomorrow and then sometime during the day, if possible, to have a quick meeting that would take 15 minutes to get you to sign the warning. That okay. So you're at, so what you're doing, what you're considering doing, is having a a meeting with a lawyer to figure out the article. Have a special select board meeting to authorize that article to be put forward, right. which so would right also now, include would also include the authorization to go ahead and purchase the first truck? Well, <coughs> or not the authorization to or purchase the first truck, truck, the authorization to finance okay. and the repay, purchase that and already repay. So do we okay. make the motion to authorize the purchase of the first truck tonight? No. Oh, yeah. And then you're yeah. going to set up the article to reimburse and possibly purchase based on voter approval. So if the board is in an agreement with the purchase, emergency purchase of the first truck, we can simply make a motion for that. 
Do you, you don't need a motion to, to have an, an article drafted up? No. Okay. So just the motion for the purchase of the emergency purchase of the new pump truck at up to 500000 I would say four hundred and sixty five. What what yeah. was it? Four hundred it, it's it's four sixty one, okay. but I think Bill is right. I mean it's up to four sixty five. Four sixty five is not gonna change anything. And you're gonna figure out where it's gonna come from. <laughs> well yeah, we've got money in, we've got money in the bank that we can pay for it. I, I can assure you we're not gonna spend one cent more than what we need to to right. put stuff on this truck so it's an actual fire truck. It doesn't make sense and it's foolhardy to take old stuff, 20-year-old ladders um, that have been through the battle days and putting it on a new truck. Yep. They get tested every year and there's more and more bend to those ladders. That's I'll make a motion to approve the amount that was discussed <laughs> after 465000 for the emergency purchase of a replacement pump truck. I second that Okay, motion been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, all those who wish to approve say aye. 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 And um, for the, because we're still targeting to have a special town meeting, I think it would be helpful if you could get an estimate because somebody else is going to ask how much would it cost to fix that tank. No, no, I will. I will. So we have that information, and the select board yeah. and I can talk about it. And you know, I mean, I was thinking that the, uh, you know, my comment before, could we fix the tank and make it last five years? Well, even if we could make it last two years, and then one of the other trucks you could extend two years, you might be able to get on in every five-year schedule. Um, so it's worth knowing. I think for this truck, though, because of the, the demo deal, I think, I think maybe we should think about extending the next ones. Because I think if we end up, we can spend 489 for the one that we're talking about in November versus 537 or right. 512. So yeah, 512, 453. You made the mistake of saying take two trucks and make good, one good one. Now, <laughs> now it's in my head. I, 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 I think you could take two trucks and make one that might get by. <laughs> so Gary, one other question there. Uh, typical warranty on these things. I hope, I'd like to hope it was more than a year, but. Yeah, it, you know, even though sometimes we find things um, the rescue truck, as an example, we've had it for four or five years. Um, we have found a couple little places where the, the paint is bubbling, um, but he's going to fix it at no cost to us. Yeah, we'll buy uh, that in yeah so um, so that warranty is, is is expired, but he's he he takes care of the trucks that he sells, and he's going to fix that. Uh, paint job but typical warranty a year yes yeah see because of my situation there with my equipment I'm, I'm squeezing these guys for three years because you know yeah I got enough equipment and only sure. a number amount of operators and it doesn't get the use so right okay well thanks for coming in thanks Gary and no, helping no us out with this and thank you very much yeah thank you so the next item on the manager's thing is, oh, thank you. if we have to have a special town meeting, do you want to include the roadside more on that? <laughs> At the last meeting, we talked about, well, I'll just figure out a way to buy it. Um, was this specific to a mower that became available? Is that still in play, or is that one gone? No, that one was, what we talked about was buying the mower that we've been using. Right. Um, it's still out there being used, and it's probably going to be available in, in November. Um, and we, we, the last meeting, you basically said we're going to buy it, I believe. 
some bad events that for the direct the line. I think there was a general consensus that and, we and probably should buy it first. Said, I don't think we should have a special town meeting because it's it'll be expensive and let's just buy it and we'll tell the voters in the spring what we did and why we did it and uh, well, that's the a, people from the conservation commission were here and they supported buying them all and now we're having a meeting it seems should we be yeah. up front with the voters and, and tell them we want to buy this? That's a lot smaller purchase than what we're doing now. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think it makes sense. I to think include. part of the point was that the um, it helps control invasives and. No, no, I'm not talking yeah. about whether we should buy it. What I'm well, asking is should we include it on the warning for the special meeting? Right, hey, we're going for broke. We might as well throw our jump over the cliff while we're at it. So. Might as well throw that in. Yeah, along I, I, would say I, just I just threw that in because yeah, that could so. be a selling point. That's I think all. everybody's said yes, put it on right. the warning, right? Yes. And, and we'll, yeah. I'll get uh, better information as to what we're going to buy and how much and everything else. But. Bill, can you um, maybe just to hand it, have it at this special meeting or, or email it out, can you update this balance sheet with the um, I guess maturity dates or the dates that these loans are going to come off, um, yep. and also maybe include the. I mean, I guess we can calculate you know, it a little I bit. Can, I can, what I the year? You know what I'm saying? So which ones are coming off? Which ones are coming? Yeah. You know, like because we're adding, it would be nice to know which ones are, right. are coming. I, off. I can easily do that. I've got a whole different spreadsheet. Yep. I just thought just before the meeting, yeah. I said I can at least show them what we owe now sure. and what's coming off, and you know, we paid off. Um, you can see. I knew there were a couple that I think. The storm drain one is zero. We paid that off in 18. We're going to pay the highway bond off this year. Do you know what those were yearly? Um, the storm drain was 20, 15, and the, this, the highway garage was 10. 10,000 a year? Yeah. And the other one was 20,000 a year. So 30K of the potential 200. Is there a reason why some of these numbers are on the left and some of them are on the right? Yeah, Space. just just so, I'm not quite <laughs> just so we could read. Just so we could read. But it had nothing to do with. Okay, no, they're all negative. They're all. It, no, what that means is the the, the <laughs> seventy-five thousand dollar number. We're going to pay off twelve thousand five hundred dollars this year, and it's going to go to sixty-two five. And then the next line, I just wanted to be able to get it beside there. My writing is not, I can't write so small. So okay. I Otherwise, just alternated sides just so okay. you could see. I understand that very well, Bill. that I was missing. No, thank no. you. The important thing, Jane, is that <laughs> at 2018, we owe $5,670,000. Right. At the end of 18, it's going to be down to $5,142,000. Okay. Right. We're getting there. Until we borrow more. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I was going to say, they seem to come on faster than they come off. Okay. Uh, parking ordinance enforcement. We don't really have to talk about that. Yet. Okay. So what about an ordinance? Oh, I was going to say, say that we've got a parking ordinance. We don't have any means to enforce it. Well, should we enforce it? If so, should we put something in the budget for next year? We can can talk about that. Quite honestly, I don't even know if we ought to be dealing with this issue until after the construction's over with, because right now parking is hell no matter at a premium. what, you know, so it's uh, difficult as it is. There were 25 cars at 51 South Main Street by 9 o'clock this morning. Good. Hey, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's people the parking lot should be full. That's where we want them to bring us out. So they're starting to get... Okay. They're starting to catch on then, huh? Can we, keep, can we permanently keep uh, the flashing this, parking Discuss arrows? next week meeting. <laughs> yeah. I think we've already been, may end up with a, so a quicker meeting. When do you want to be to deal with this warning? It's got to be this week. I can no matter when, so it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, my schedule is all over the place, but I can try to make it. Well, is it, could it be easier, early in the morning. Like, is it 8 o'clock meeting, 9 o'clock meeting, or oh, 4 o'clock meeting? I could do an 8 o'clock meeting. That might be Monday, good. Mornings are tough. Yeah, mornings are tough for me, too. All right, that's fine. I can do uh, it. But really, it really doesn't matter. Really, I mean, we need three to sign one. 
It would be nice if we had five. But it would be I mean, I'll come no matter what, but uh, okay, so I, unless I, it's I after dark, probably it's an afternoon. Thursday, Thursday is the only day. Afternoon would be best for me. Thursday. Thursday is the only day I can't. Yeah. Remember. You can't yeah. Four o'clock? Yeah. Which day? Four o'clock is good for me Thursday. I can't do it on Thursday. Oh, well, maybe by four. I might. If you were relying upon me, I would say no. I could do it later. Wednesday, four o'clock. For short meeting, I guess that'd be a number of five. I'll, but I got to be at four thirty. So it's so okay. Meeting. I could do that at four. Yeah, we should. I, I could. I'll sign up, and then if four of us say yes, if one of us right, has one to, of us can't make it though. Bow out. So Wednesday at four. Wednesday at four. Do we have four people? No, that's no good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's no good because we we're so, it's not really an emergency. Can we do it over the phone, or at least one? You know what you could do? You could recess this meeting until, yeah. Instead of adjourning tonight, you can just recess. This yeah. Meeting. But then do we all have to be here when we? That'll stay warm, you mean? Oh, to make Wednesday work? Yeah, because you're supposed to warn a select board meeting 48 hours in advance, and we, for 4 o'clock Wednesday, we would have had to post it at 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock today. Can we set a time on Wednesday when we all email you our answers? <laughs> You're going to have to sign the warning. <laughs> no, we can, we can uh, recess it till then. Are you the only one that can't make it Thursday? I can make it Thursday, but probably it would be later, like five. I could do. That's not good. That's too late. Thursday is going to be better for me personally. I can make it Wednesday or Thursday. All right. Why don't we say Thursday at four if you can't make it? I'll try if I can get it. if I can get released. I'll. Okay. As long as kind of three of you get here, so we don't need to recess then. Yeah, don't recess. I, I, again, I don't want to take a chance and yeah, yeah, recess yeah. it and then somebody freaks out that we shouldn't have done that. So yeah. Thursday at 4, okay. All right. And the last little note that I want to make before we adjourn is... Uh, Sorry. Oh. The reason why that's on there, though, discuss meeting date, is because the next regularly scheduled meeting is supposed to be... October 21st, and I'm going to be away from here from the 19th of October until uh, I think the 31st. So, do you want to just wait until? Do you want to meet without me? Is the question. I certainly have no problem if you meet without me, but I don't know what what there is to. Pass you out. I mean, budget season's right around the corner, right? So when we get back, when you get back, we'll start we'll doling into down. that. So you want to just November fourth, the next regular scheduled meeting. So fourth. cancel the twenty first. I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. I'm Maybe you can email us about the issue with the flashing traffic sign that these people were concerned with. Yeah. Well, I'll find. I'll look into that, and um, I mean, I'm assuming that if the if the state says that they'll reimburse us for it, you just want me to put it up. I, I for sure. Think, you know, yeah. I'll just do that. You yeah. don't need to make the motion. I, okay. I get the gist of your of your um, request. Well, I'm okay. also looking to portable Bless speed bumps to see if we can get a few of those. When you say flashing, is it the one that has the speed it's on the, it? It's, like it's so the, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, Your speed is... Like the one on Stowe Street. Yeah, I think the one yeah. on Street yeah. yeah. okay. flashes over a certain I, speed. Or, I think yeah. that one on Stowe Street's been pretty effective. Slows me down. <laughs> okay. The speeders down. So anyway, the uh, no meeting on the 21st, regular meeting on the 4th, right? Up there. Yep. <laughs> Okay. All right, and just food for thought. Um, the other day uh, I heard on the radio or TV or whatever that uh, New York was holding a seminar on 
Well, they call it the Adirondack Champlain Regional Salt Summit. And over 150 businesses were attending it to talk about what to do about reducing salt use. Really? That's impacting, and I have yet to have the time to sit down on the computer and look this up to see what took place, but I plan on doing so. Um, so it happened. Oh, it happened. Right? They just had it. They just had it, yeah. And um, so, so I guess. Uh, somebody asked here if any other town, so I asked other towns, the bigger cities and towns, if anybody had policies on salt and sand spreading. Got a couple responses back. Um, the most interesting ones, though, were from uh, towns that said they are in, in you know, designated impaired waterways, and uh, what the Agency of Natural Resources has requested of them is to reduce or eliminate, if possible, sand use and use salt for highway treatment because the sand is, washes into the river, carries the, carries all of the pathogens and all the bad stuff and silts up the, the, the bottoms of the, of the streams. So that was from St. Albans Town. So they almost use no sand. They, they use sand if it gets below, I don't know, 15 degrees or something like that when salt won't work. Uh, but otherwise, they're all salt, no sand at all. So. You see a lot in upstate New York, a lot of towns, and you see signs there, no salt zones. You know, yeah, you so know entering no no. Generally for in watersheds. Uh, right. Uh, it's, it's, it's John, if you go exactly. from St. John's to Lindenville, there's a, re, re, you know, reduced salt because of uh, but you see this a lot in the Adirondacks. But anyway, I'm just saying yeah. there, was, there was no really yeah. great policy that I could No, have. I mean, my discussion was about perhaps reducing both if it's a possibility. No, no, I, I understand. You know, I'm, I'm I haven't given up on it yet, just to let you know. <laughs> so, having said that, I'd take a motion to adjourn and we can get the hell out of here. So moved. All right, second? Second. All right, all those approved. Aye. 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 Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Yeah.